yes okay sir so now now i invite okay so now i invite our president of natural science association rebecca to share a few words good afternoon sir am i audible yes rebecca go ahead yeah, yeah. Uh, turn on your cameras students when you speak so i have a little bit of internet uh, problem so i not able to switch on my video okay carry on okay. a very good afternoon to everyone present here my name is rebecca joanna president of the national science association it is my immense pleasure and joy to talk about our zoology department and our natural science association the department of zoology ever since its inception in 1957 is actively involved in teaching zoology for undergraduate degree courses in combination with other disciplines the faculty unites the disciplines of general zoology cell biology and genetics human anatomy physiology developmental biology ecology ethology and evolutionary biology the zoology department has several excellent teaching facilities including well equipped laboratories natural science association was was established in the year 1957 it was the brainchild of zoology department of st joseph's college autonomous bangalore this association is one of the oldest and has been active from the past 63 years it was with an aim of providing a platform for co curricular activities that nsa was established natural science association has imparted knowledge to many batches of students which is the largest in the country and still strives to reach out to each and every student on campus and outside the campus providing an opportunity to them to learn new things nsa continues to do their best in successfully organizing all kinds of activities natural science association conducts zoo talks workshops on various aspects webinars seminars outdoor activities like birding field visits nature walks volunteering programs etc providing a platform to share views thoughts and work experiences and helping other fellow students i once again welcome everyone to the international webinar on varanids sit back and imbibe the knowledge put together by our wonderful speakers for today dr andre and ms shreya thank you i now call upon father xavier to give us the presidential address for today good afternoon everyone dr andre coach ms shreya bhattacharya dr jay shankar our head of the department and you my dear young friends when saturday has been a usual lockdown day today this weekend is a different day when everything is open i am sure our young friends would have been in the shopping mall and the best of parks to have the best of sunshine but st joseph's make it a different invites them to venture towards the unknown to row into the deep which is the jesuit philosophy of looking for the margins the more and it is with that intention today i'm sure those who are participating in this webinar i wouldn't like to take much time by keeping the best speakers in front of us but just to address the jesuit characteristics you may ask what this environmentalist has to talk about monitor lizard but if you look at the root of our constitution article 51 ag from the directive principle of state policy says it shall be the duty of every citizen of india to protect and improve the natural environment forests lakes wildlife and to have compassion for every living creature and it is this intention with which we have gathered together even if it is all the herpetologists together coming to know about monitor lizard socially and culturally it may have its own repercussions and with misunderstood economic implications this particular lizard may be misused to the core of greed purposes but what happens today is what we are going to listen through Dr. Coach, 
from Bonn, Germany. I was fortunate enough to attend the top in Bonn, Germany before after the Paris one. And now I am very glad from Shonar Bangla, we have our own Shreya Bhattacharya to address us and welcome. Welcome to the audience. Welcome to the speakers. The stage is yours because we believe in an education which Srimad Bhagavad Gita has taught us from Karma Yoga chapter 518. Vidya Vinaya Sampanne Brahmane Gavihastini Suni Saiva Swapakecha Panditaha Samadarshinaha. Education promotes gentleness and humility and it makes the gods. Cows, elephants, dog, and dog eaters have the summer that Shinaha equal vision over every creature on earth. With that faith, we come to you, listen to you, and the stage is yours. Thank you very much. Most welcome for this webinar. Thank you, Father Xavier, for accepting our invitation and for giving a very wonderful speech. Over to you, Abhishek. Thank I would you so also much. Like to join Abhishek. I would fail in my duty if I don't. It was a last minute notice that I reached out to our research director, Father Xavier. Uh, Father, thank you for accepting our invitation to be here and to deliver the presidential address. Thank, thank you. you very much, sir. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you so much, Father. We are glad with your presence here. Now I would like to invite Ajay for the general introductions on Varanids. Over to you, Ajay. A warm afternoon to one and all present here. This is Ajay Vikram from third year CEZ, and I'll be just giving a brief intro on Varanids. The Varanidae, or family of lizards, the super family Varanoidea, within the Agumimorpha group. The family, a group of carnivorous and frugivorous lizards, includes the living genus Varanus and a number of extinct genera. Varanus includes the Komodo dragon, which is termed as the largest living lizard, crocodile monitors, savanna, and the governors of the Australia and Southeast Asia, and various other species with similarly distinctive appearances. Monitor lizards are robust diurnal lizards with long and non autonomous tails and elongated necks. They are reputed to be among the most intelligent lizards. With no further delay, and now I call upon Abhishek to introduce the first speaker of the day. Over to you, Abhishek. Thank you so much, Ajay. Dear friends, the wait is over now. I'm glad to welcome our guest speaker, Dr. Andre. Dr. Andre has 20 years of research experience on monitor lizard. Since 2003, he has been conducting research about the taxonomy and systematics, biology, and conservation of the monitor lizards. Once again, I welcome you, sir, to the virtual stage. Yes, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here tonight, uh, today and um, to present you some of my work and to present you especially this interesting group of uh, monitor lizards. Um, yeah, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Jayashanka for the invitation and also Abhishek Mishra for organizing the technical um, support. So let me start my presentation. Can you see it? Yes, sir. Yes, we can see. Go ahead, sir. Okay. So yeah, I'd like to um, give a contribution about the discovery and international protection of monitor lizards because these are the most uh, the main aspects of my research during yeah the the last years. And um, yeah, after this nice um, short introduction of the monitor lizards, I have to add just a few words and um, illustrate this with a few pictures of these amazing creatures because monitor lizards. Um, yeah, are mostly known as big, huge lizards. The the Komodo dragon is the most famous one, but there are also very small uh, species like this Australian Varanus brevicauda, which is just 20 centimeters long. And so the variation in in the body dimensions are amazing in these lizards. And this is just one aspect of their fascinating biology and nature. 
uh, nearly each year new uh, fascinating uh, aspects of these lizards are discovered and this is one uh, which was already found out um, 15 years ago which was that um, the Komodo dragon was also able to reproduce uh, parthenogenetically which means that uh, the females can give birth to juveniles without males and this is now known from uh, several monitor lizards um, in 2014, we published this little report about another species of the Indicus group. And um, I believe that all monitor lizard species are able to reproduce um, parthenogenetically. Yeah, here is just a picture of one of these um, juveniles which was born without a father. And um, at the same time, this aspect of the biology is probably one uh, explanation for the huge distribution also on Pacific and remote islands group because only one female is necessary to colonize the island and then it can um, found a new population. This is what um, the adults look like of these Pacific monitors. Um, yeah, here's a map to show you the distribution, the global distribution of monitor lizards. So they have a um, uh, they are mostly distributed in Africa, Southern Asia, as well as the Indo-Australian and Australian region. But um, they are not equally distributed. No. Okay, here's um, just a representative of the monitors. Um, so in Africa, we find just five species. In Asia, there are seven species. And um, in Australia, oops. Oh, here. Uh, in Australia, we have 28 species. And in Indo-Australia, there are 41 in total, which is due to the many um, island endemics we find in this region. The nearest um, relative of monitor lizards is the earless monitor, Lantanotos, and this is found um, in Borneo, which is here in black. Um, I hope you can see my mouse. And um, next closely related are the Hylodermatids from um, yeah, Central America to Mexico which are known as um, also as beaded lizards and the Gila monster. And uh, they are known for the for the poison. Although in recent years was also discovered that monitor lizards also possess a uh, um, yeah, poison in their um, saliva. When we focus now on Southeast Asia, which was the, the main area of my research, um, here is again the species numbers, which increases towards New Guinea and Australia, where, we, as I showed before, we have a lot of uh, species in Australia. And um, yeah, this is the map uh, which you should keep in mind, but I will show you again several times. So I'd like to start with the Asian water monitor lizard. This is the species complex uh, with which I started um, my first research, my diploma thesis in 2003. Uh, here is an, a specimen from Sri Lanka, which is the type locality of Varana salvator. And um, your yeah, water monitors are um, not just very good swimmers, and they all also, or yeah, nearly always found close to water bodies, um, but they're also one of the largest monitor lizard species, and so they are also top predators in their environments, reaching a total length of yeah, I think also three meters. There are reports, historical ones. Um, yeah, at the same time, they are very adaptable to human-influenced habitats, as you can see here in this, yeah, at this dirty uh, riverbed. And um, yeah, due to their capability to swim very well, they have one of the largest distribution ranges of monitor lizards. And uh, this is the map. Um, showing the taxonomic status of this group before I started my uh, research. So we had just one species, Varan salvator, and eight subspecies, which are more or less widely distributed. And at, this, um, at the first glance, it becomes obvious that um, we have widely distributed taxa here in this light green, 
and we have some very restricted island endemics like um, on the Andaman, uh, Andamanese islands here and also here. And um, yeah, there is this strange uh, taxon Komaini here in, um, in, in Thailand on the, this um, isthmus of, of Kra. Uh, Kra. So um, there was obviously some, uh, and also at the same time, some disjunct distributions when you consider here Sri Lanka and the nearest um, uh, populations are here in uh, north uh, eastern India. So there is a big gap on the Indian continent. Yeah, after my diploma thesis, um, this pattern changed. Um, as far as the mainland populations as well as the Greater Sunda Islands were allocated to a different taxon, which is Macromaculatus. And um, but the most um, or yeah, one of the, another major find was that the morphological differentiation of the Philippine um, taxa, Mamoratus, Nuchales, and Comingi, justified their recognition as distinct species. The same was uh, my conclusion for this little island endemic, Tobianus, uh, here near Sulawesi. And um, so we had at the end of my um, diploma in 2004, um, yeah, the results were published in 2007, we had not just one species, what it was. Um, Suddenly, due to my investigation, it was uh, five species and less subspecies, of course. So it became a species group, this complex. Um, I also could show this, this um, taxon Comaini is actually just a melanistic form of the mainland um, subspecies Macromaculatus. So they are totally black, they show no pattern at all, which is a typical yeah, phenomenon of melanism, as you can see in the Black Panther, for instance. Good, but um, these investigations were not finished with my diploma, and um, so we published another study in 2010, focusing just on the Philippine uh, taxa, uh, together with my colleague um, Maren Gaulke, who has been working there for decades, and um, together with my PhD supervisor, Wolfgang Böhme. So first some pictures about these um, the, the known um, species from the Philippines, which is this wonderful, uh, beautifully colored Varanus comingii. Then we have Varanus momoratus and Varanus nuchalis, where the name already implies one characteristic of the Philippine species, which is the enlarged uh, neck scales, the nuchal scales. Here in the back, they are very enlarged compared to other uh, water monitor lizards. And yeah, we investigated um, the morphology of these species. Um, and this is a, um, a principal component analysis of um, yeah, scalation uh, characters, uh, showing on one side um, those uh, populations from Borneo and um, Nuchalis as well as Maoratus. Um, Comingi was excluded here because they were overlapping, but this species is so distinct from its color pattern, it was not necessary. Um, and, um, but what was interesting is to see that Mamoratus, um, the population of Mamoratus, which, is, which were spread across different islands, I'll show you in a minute on the map, um, were also morphologically um, separate, uh, separate, separable. So this, the population from Palawan um, was morphologically distinct, as well as two specimens from um, the little uh, Zulu islands, and they are also very remote. So this justified the description of some new species of monitor lizards, and this is one of them from Palawan. We called it Varanus palavanensis due to the type locality, and um, Varanus rasmussini, um, which was dedicated to a colleague um, of my supervisor, which deceased um, some time ago and honoring uh, his name with this um, species here uh, from Copenhagen. And um, yeah, here they don't look very distinct, but when you look specifically at the, at the juveniles, it becomes obvious that uh, they show a very specific pattern uh, the juveniles, um, uh, which is totally different from other water monitor lizard populations. 
Um, we also described um, a subspecies of these yellow Varanus cumingii, um, the Marensis. And um, yeah, meanwhile, this uh, subspecies was elevated to a distinct species by some um, American colleagues because they also did a um, revision. They continued our uh, revision. Um, yeah, this is um, for comparison. The subspecies or the Zamarensis, and this is now Cumingiae. Yeah, to summarize up, my results is uh, here this map again. Um, but at the same time, um, there are still was still some question marks in 2010. Uh, for instance, we had no material from the island of Mindoro in the central Philippines, so it wasn't clear if this uh, population also differentiated, and um, on the map, you see these gray areas and um, gray shading, and these are um, islands which were uh, fused together when the global sea levels were lower during the Pleistocene with the ice ages. You know that um, a lot of water was um, formed into ice, and so global sea levels were much lower than today, and this had a uh, had severe uh, consequences for the geography of uh, Southeast Asia. So many islands became larger, fused together, and on this island we today um, find mostly the same species. And this was also the case in um, the water monitors, although they are good swimmers, as I said. But nevertheless, um, the differentiation uh, during the evolution took place. Yeah, so this is um, from uh, some US colleagues. They continued our investigations and at the same time they confirmed our new species, uh, although Rasmussini was not included due to the um, yeah, remote uh, remoteness. Um, it's difficult to do field work there. They are also terrorists, um, unfortunately. Um, and at the same time, this, they described a new two new species uh, from um, Mindoro. It was um, called Bangonorum, and then what was, which was very um, interesting that on Luzon there was not just one species but two, so uh, there was a differentiation, and they called it uh, Dalupasa. So the the number of species even grows through this, and uh, just on the Philippines we now have about uh, six or seven sp different species. So coming back to this group, um, I already told um, uh, something about uh, this Pleistocene sea level changes. I here would like to, uh, to, to demonstrate what this means, because it, uh, when the sea level um, uh, were lower, this man means that, um, for instance, mainland Southeast Asia was connected um, with the greater Sunda Island. So you, this was one big landmass called the Oriental Realm. And on the other side, so and there we have typical Asian yeah, species here, mammals like elephants and tigers and all these um, areas. And on the other side, we have Australia, which formed together with New Guinea, a huge island. Um, and this is the Australian realm. But in between, we find islands which had never a connection with the mainland. And these are the Lesser Zunda Islands, Sulawesi and the Moluccas. Yeah, in Australia, of course, we have the famous uh, marsupials like kangaroos, and uh, in between there are, um, yeah, there were due to this um, clear distribution patterns, some demarcation lines were drawn in the past um, and hypothesized by researchers. One was Wallace line, the other one was Lydekas line. And um, in between, we also have not just a strong sea currents, which prevent a colonization of these islands, but um, also deep ocean trenches. And uh, this resulted in a high degree of endemism in this area. And that's why it became its own name. Um, and it's called Wallacea, honoring Alfred Russell Wallace, um, the famous um, uh, naturalist who traveled to this uh, region in the 19th century, discovered uh, not just many species, but was also the co-founder of the um, uh, theory of evolution together with Charles Darwin. And for the monitor lizards, we find a similar pattern that we have water monitor, the group of water monitors, which came from, um, yeah, from the south, you know, from the northwest, um, reaching the Philippines, but also Sulawesi, as I will show. And another group of monitors, which are the Pacific monitors, and they 
uh, came from Australia and the Pacific realm. And both groups meet in this Wallacea region, which is interesting because it was long thought they would never occur sympatrically at the same island. But this was also shown some years ago. So just a short excursion to the Pacific monitor lizards. Um, because there we could also describe a new species after I, uh, when I finished my first uh, field work there in 2005. Because we went to the remote Talaut Islands and they are um, located here between Sulawesi, which was the main focus of my diploma thesis, and um, here the uh, southern Philippines, because I wanted to investigate if these islands were used as stepping stones for the colonization of Sulawesi by monitor lizards. But instead of water monitors, which were known from both these islands, the Philippines and Sulawesi, we did find another species group, which were these Pacific monitors. And um, they even represented a new species, which we called Varanus lirungensis in 2009, um, after the village of Lirung, where we found this um, new species. Good, but coming back to the Asian mon uh, monitor lizards and Sulawesi. Um, I already um, showed that there was one species known since the 19th century, which was called Varanus togianus, and which are rather uniform black colored um, monitors, except for the ventral side. Here you can see some light uh, pattern on the throat, for instance. And they were described from this tiny island group here, the Togian Islands, uh, in the center of Sulawesi. Um, at the northern peninsula, the uh, monitor lizards are more colorful um, and there is a name available called um, Varano Salvatore Celebensis. Uh, Celebes is the old name for the island of Sulawesi, so it's changed its, uh, its name in the past. And uh, then we found also um, totally different looking monitors, uh, particularly on the small islands between uh, Sulawesi and the Lesser Sunder Islands, which we also visited because they could have um, served as stepping stones from the from the south. And uh, this is another island population. So what we found, and this is just um, a short overview, but we found even more different looking monitor populations, which um, demonstrate that there was that there are still new, yeah, at least subspecies, perhaps uh, species to be described. Um, and uh, the diversity of this monitor group is not yet fully um, discovered and described. One interesting aspect, which I became aware of after my first um, expedition to Indonesia, was about um, these monitors. Um, so they are also nearly totally black specimens on the main island of Sulawesi, um, but they are obviously show differences to the population from the Togian Islands. That's why I put a CF here, because they look similar. So when I came back from my first um, excursion to Indonesia, I was looking at telev a television documentary about monitor lizards, and it was called the, the Monitor Man of Sulawesi. And because I just returned from this island, I was a bit surprised hmm, because I didn't meet any monitor humans there, moni monitor uh, persons. But the story which was um, told in this um, this documentary was very fascinating and because I could not find anything about this in the literature I decided to to write this down in a little um, article because it um, was about the phenomenon of uh, called Kemba Buaya which means um, monitor twins so it's um, it's it's a very close relationship between these monitor lizards and the people that live there and um, so in this documentary uh, this, uh, there was a family uh, which was introduced, and this is the father, and he has two children, one son and one daughter. And in this picture, he's ho holding his daughter in his hands because these people believe that um, monitor lizards have a human soul, or some monitor lizards at least. And um, this was the sister born as a twin to his son child. So um, it's a very fascinating um, relationship and it, it even goes further because in the documentary um, it was told that uh, in, a, in, a, in a close village to where they live there was another monitor lizard which was even considered to be some kind of a godness and um, I had never uh, heard of, about this before. 
but uh, and unfortunately haven't seen it myself, experienced it not uh, myself. But I um, got in contact with a, a, a Frenchman, Jean-Baptiste Fauvel, and he was able to, to, to see some people and to meet a family which had also um, a, a monotel as a child. And here it's even larger than its mom. <laughs> so because they are more yeah, up to two meters long, uh, long and um, yeah, they are treated as children. They are fat with rice, although it's not the typical uh, food for them. But shows a very interesting relationship between man and um, these animals. But unfortunately, ah, so yeah. But uh, the thing is that um, this word or this is expression, Kembabuaya, does not mean monitor twins, but actually it means crocodile twin. The the translation, and um, so this phenomenon comes from a close relation between humans and crocodiles. But because crocodiles are certainly uh, becoming much larger and therefore also more dangerous than monitors. People have yeah, probably changed also because uh, because the crocodiles become more rare than the monitor lizards. They changed these animals from crocodiles, which are not as easy to handle. I think um, here you can see these very big sharp teeth than monitor lizards. But um, yeah, nevertheless, the relationship between humans and um, these uh, lizards is not as always as peaceful and there is a lot of um, problems and conflicts but yeah mostly of course the monitors um, uh, yeah, are the, on the, are the unlucky part I don't know how to say uh, here in this case it's um, uh, monitors are often road killed you can see this regularly on the streets at the other side monitors are um, used as pets and uh, they are also, at least in some parts of Indonesia, they are used as a food source. And um, yeah, this was a freshly killed specimen for uh, consumption. But the main uh, purpose um, for which monotolists are killed, especially, especially in Indonesia, is for their skins. And um, yeah, these are pictures from a skinnery um, from Mark Aulia, my close cooperation partner. And um, yeah, giving you an expression of this cruel um, treatment because um, alone Indonesia um, legally exports nearly half a million of um, monotolid skins each year. And um, yeah, what the people do with these uh, skins is such luxury products as uh, watches and also these bags. Here you can still see the nice pattern on the back of the uh, water monitor lizards and um, yeah so this is uh, not a sustainable use as in crocodiles you also know that we can buy these products made of crocodile skin but for crocodiles we have farms but this is not the case for monitor lizards so they're all taken from the wild and there is no regulation nobody has ever counted how many monitor lizards are there still available and what influence this harvesting has on the natural population. So I come to the next topic, which is the threat and conservation of monitor lizards to save these top predators for over from overexploitation and extinction. Although these numbers here are now outdated by more than 10 years, um, the numbers have not changed. So as I already said, nearly yeah, half a million. Sorry. Yes. Everything is okay. I believe there's an echo effect, uh, Dr. Andre. There's what? There's an echo or hurt. There's what? If you kept two devices on, uh, this tends to happen. Okay, just continue. Yeah, now it is clear. I okay. think it's subsided, yes. Please, okay. carry on. Yes, thanks. Okay, so although these numbers are outdated, um, the, the numbers are still the same. So, as I said, even um, last year, and uh, yeah, it's going on that nearly half a million of monitor lizards are legally um, exported for products, as you can see here. Although um, in the lower right side, it's uh, obvious that these bags were made from um, cobras. Here you can still see the nice pattern from the bag. So, also other reptiles are exploited for these kinds of um, yeah, fashion goods. Another threat is the habitat destruction 
because um, the forests are cleared. Um, here is some um, yeah, very sad pictures, I think from uh, Borneo. And um, so the natural forest is replaced by huge plantations of palm oil. And um, yeah, you might be aware of this. It's one of the, it's the cheapest oil, um, plant oil in the world. And it's in nearly every second product you can buy in a supermarket. And um, yeah, this leads to a big habitat loss and also loss of um, global biodiversity um, affecting all species. I mean, monotolids are even able to survive in these uh, plantations, but um, all nearly all other creatures um, have problems. And um, yeah, so we um, started some publications um, to, to bring this topic and these pressing problems, as we called it here, to a broader audience. And this was uh, also to provide an updated checklist and um, some identification key, because uh, with the growing numbers of new species, it was difficult to get an overview if you were not an expert in this uh, monitor lizards. And this was based on the external characters like color pattern and so on. Um, <clears throat> but because I mentioned that the monitors are also traded for their skins, uh, mostly, we, um, yeah, I had a student some years ago, Yannick Buklich, and he investigated um, the yeah, microstructure of the monitor lizard scales. And this became a very um, impressive uh, monograph um, with a lot of um, brilliant um, electron microscope um, photograph uh, photographs. And this showed for the first time that the scales of monitor lizards, which are very small compared to their large size, um, show a high um, diversity also in their pattern and shape. And this is um, at least specific for each subgenus. So there were all monitors are separated into different subgenera. And among these groups, uh, you can see cl um, clear differences. So we will focus on the picture in the upper right corner. Um, this is of a very interesting species, which is very little known because it's from the remote Solomon Islands. Um, the species is long known, Varanus spinulosus, and also already in its name, um, is it, it implies that the, the scales are spine-like. And um, this is also seen in our um, enlarged, um, when we increased um, here these neck scales, for instance. And because this is a unique um, shape of the scales, um, we erected a new subspecies calling it a Solomon Zaurus due to the Solomon Islands in this case. And uh, this was also confirmed now genetically that uh, this monitor represents a distinct and ancient um, evolutionary lineage of monitor lizards. Um, coming back to the Pacific monitors on the right side is Varanus dorianus. Um, and they were together put with the tree monitor lizards. Here you see on the left side, Varanus prasinus, which are very arboreal species living mostly on trees uh, on New Guinea and surrounding islands. And they were formally put together in one group due to characters of their, um, uh, of their sexual organs. And, um, but as you can see um, above, the scales have also a totally different shape. And this um, uh, yeah, leads to the conclusion that they should also be separated at the subgenus level. So for the tree monitor lizards, we erected a new sub uh, subgenus called Haptorosaurus. This refers to the tail, which they can use yeah, like monkeys uh, for grabbing um, trees or the, the, the branches for better support climbing. And this also distingu uh, distinguishes them from the Pacific monitors. So, um, so the, yeah, this, this uh, investigation that the scales were important to differentiate between, um, the, to, to identify also the skins. And um, then some years later, we uh, founded um, a, a specialist group of the IUCN, the United, what is it, IUCN? It's the largest um, organization for nature conservation worldwide. And this has um, several subs uh, subgroups for distinct um, plant and animal 
groups and uh, there was no specialist group for monitor lizards so together with Mark Aulia we founded this group in 2014 and had a inaugural meeting in Bangkok in 2015 and together with Mark um, we served as uh, co-chairs of this um, group until 2020 and now he's continuing alone um, I'm um, an ordinary member now um, as also Schreier is since 2018 and um, yeah, one of the main purposes of this group was to um, re-evaluate the, 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 the threatened status of all monotelizid species. For instance, the famous Komodo dragon was last evaluated in 1997 as vulnerable. And so this was uh, yeah, more than 20 years old, this assessment, and um, it's important, uh, uh, especially in these island uh, endemics, because the Komodo dragons are just found on um, some very small islands, uh, it's important to, to monitor their population status. So in 2019, um, this was um, re-evaluated and it uh, was shown that the status of them decreased. So now they are um, listed as endangered species and yeah, should get more um, attention to, to save this uh, iconic uh, monitor species in the future. So uh, another publication was this visual identification guide, um, which we published together with Mark O'Lear in 2020. And we did this on behalf of the Federal Agency for Nature Conservation um, because yeah, monitor lizards are um, traded not just as pets, but also as, um, as, the, the, as their yeah, skins just. But it's so difficult for customs to control these, um, the international law. And so um, they wanted to have some um, yeah, guidance for identification of monitor lizards and some um, yeah, data about the distribution, also about reproduction. And um, so for each monitor species, more than 80, we made these uh, summary of information. Here is, uh, for instance, of uh, the Bengal monitor. And the whole thing was published in uh, German and English to be available for yeah, um, the broadest audience possible. And on the left side, um, we summarized things like, like names, like local names also, if uh, the distribution and then typical characteristics, um, how you can identify the species and uh, which are similar species, in this case, for, uh, for instance, Varanus nebulosus. And on the right side, several pictures to illustrate the characters which we explain on the left side. Here's another example of Varnus lirungensis, which I already uh, showed you. And um, yeah, so we hope that this will help to, um, to enforce the, the, the legal um, regulations which are there, but um, it's always yeah, difficult to follow these rules. And at the moment, uh, Marco Lea is also creating a very comprehensive new homepage um, where he summarizes or he focuses specifically on the threats and the conservation of the monitor lizards. Yeah, and with this, um, I would like to finish and I'd like to thank you very much. Now the thank you <laughs> is missing at the end. Um, I hope um, I could give you a nice overview about um, yeah, the research during the last 20 years and about these amazing and fascinating monitor lizards. And um, now, um, yeah, my dear co uh, cooperation partner, Shreya, uh, will continue with a um, perspective of uh, India and the monitor lizards there. Thank you very much. Uh, your presence was deeply appreciated by everyone. We have learned a lot under your guidance. Thank you so much for taking our time for us, joining us today. Thank you so much, sir. It was a pleasure. Now, thank you, sir. now we'll have a session of Q&A, so people can, you can ask questions with, sir.
Good evening, uh, Dr. Kumar. Yes. Good evening, Dr. Koch. I'm Kaushik, uh, first year student at St. Joseph's College, Bangalore. And I just uh, I just love your work. It's awesome and it's great. It's a great opportunity to be here uh, in front of you and sitting for a webinar on Veranids. So I just had one particular question, Dr. Koff. I just wanted to know the effects of farming and other man-made structures and designs which exploit the habitats of reptiles, particularly monitor liz lizards and their backlash against their own nature. Yeah, this depends on the species. Um, as I as I showed, uh, the water monitor, which is very widely distributed, um, he is also able to adapt to these um, human landscapes like rice fields and stuff like that. So he has I would say not. Uh, he can even profit from the um, from the neighborhood to to humans. But on the other side, um, conflicts arise from this, as you will see in a minute. But um, there are other species which um, depend on the natural forests and habitats. And um, yeah, if there are rice fields and no trees anymore, like for like on New Guinea, um, for the tree monitors, for instance. Um, they cannot survive, I think, in these uh, agricultural landscapes. And uh, so for them, that's a big um, issue. Thank you very much, Dr. Koh, for answering my question. It's a pleasure. <laughs> pleasure for me, too. Uh, 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 good evening. Uh, uh, what we request is if the participants could raise their hand first, then we could identify and call out you so that we don't have this clash of titans. So one by one. Yes, whoever wants to go ahead can proceed asking your question. Unmute and proceed. Yes, sir. sir, this is Ajay. Uh, I'm just curious about what are the driving forces impacting evolution of monitors in the Southeast Asia, the Southeast region? The driving effects, you mean? Yes, sir, the driving force impacting the evolution of monitors. Mm, as I th uh, as I showed and uh, mentioned, I think it's um, mostly the geographic separation of of populations and the isolation on on islands, because on uh, especially these these yeah separated islands in central Indonesia, um, but also in the Pacific around New Guinea, there we find a lot of species which are um, endemic there, and this happened in um, your allopatric um, isolation through speciation, I think. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Welcome. May I? Sure. Uh, guten Tag, Dr. Andre Koch. So coming from a non-biological background, I'm studying masters in Geoinformatic and spatial development, and your talk was really interesting. So earlier, I had a meeting with you, and I saw your book, which was quite interesting for me, maybe for other people as well. So my question was, where could we find this book? Is it online available somewhere? Um, the book about the monitors, you mean? Yes. Yeah, this is available as a download, actually. Also, um, um, let me. Uh, one minute, I will um, put the link in the chat. So, can you see? Yes, I do. Thanks. Thanks very much for this book. And yeah, I, 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 I highly recommend to people as well reading this. <laughs> 
Yeah, I mean, this that's what it's for, and um, that's a good idea um, to to post the link here. So it's available from download from the governmental agency, and um, yeah, perhaps it's of help for you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Santos, please go ahead. Yeah. Oh, hi, Andre. It's Santos from the Department of Zoology. Uh, I was wondering if you know um, how well the molecular taxonomy uh, correlates with sort of the, the morphological taxonomy of the Southeast Asian parents. Um, the morphology and the phylogenetics, you mean? Uh, yes, yes. Yes. Yeah, as I said, I, I mean, I'm, I mostly myself work with morphology, morphological data. And um, so far, the results have always been confirmed by molecular data as well. So, of course, it's always better to, especially when you have um, taxonomic um, conclusions or a revision, it's always best to, to combine um, different aspects, not like uh, morphology, but also perhaps distribution the behavior perhaps and um, also genetics and because this makes a more comprehensive picture of course um, but so far um, yeah the results have been confirmed also just when working morphologically okay great i have another question um so the the color more than the scales uh, do they have a significance in in behavior or or between the sexes do they have any significance? And um, you mean like a sexual dimorphism in color pattern? Yeah, if there is sexual dimorphism, and then in generally all these color patterns, like what do they? How do they uh, fit in the ecology of the animal? Yeah, also there is no no differentiation between males and females known in the color pattern, but there is some in their body proportions um, has been demonstrated. Um, but the color pattern, um, yeah, is also kind of adaptation, of course, as I showed the, the green tree monitor, which makes sense because it lives in the trees, in the tree canopies that it's green. On the other side, there are also totally black tree monitor lizards. So um, that's an interesting question because I have also been thinking since long how this pattern evolves and it evolves uh, relatively fast. And... Um, there can be, as I said, totally black tree monitors, but there can be totally green ones. And um, so obviously the evolution of the color pattern can occur rather yeah, fast. And um, uh, like in the monitor, in the, the water monitors, where you have these transverse rows of big light spots on the back, this seems to be a very ancestral pattern, which you can see in a lot of monitor lizards, which are not closely related, but of course belong to the same um, uh, genus. But um, yeah, this, there are still a lot of open questions around this. Okay, great, thank you. Welcome. Dr. Andre, a question from the chat box. Are there any monitor lizards that display obligate parthenogenesis? Yeah, um, obligate means that they do it only, was it right? Only parthenogenesis? Exactly. Yeah, no, this is not the case. Um, it's just um, occasionally, I think it's called facultative um, parthenogenesis. But um, of course, we do not know, actually, because the, the natural populations um, have not been studied in detail of any species um, to, yeah, with, uh, at this aspect, you know. And um, this would be interesting to do, but all what we know about the reproduction today is mostly from um, captive breeding and from private persons who keep on zoos, who keep these monitor lizards uh, in terraria. Um, so although the trade for pets is a threat for monitors also, it at the same time provides important biological data because it's much easier to keep a, a lizard in a, in a terrarium as I do in my back. I have a little gecko 
uh, and to observe him and to breed them than uh, going to a forest. Uh, the, these geckos come from Madagascar uh, or to yeah, Southeast Asia and um, observe them over a long time, uh, collect data about their biology. This is very yeah, time and, and uh, intense and you need a lot of money also to do this kind of research. That's why a lot of information arises from yeah, yeah. keeping. Uh, and more field work is definitely needed. So um, this is what we also would like to encourage um, with the IOCN Monotolith Specialist Group to encourage uh, especially young people uh, to go to the field, to make observations and also to publish this um, because this helps to get a, a better picture of the of the needs of the biology and also of their um, potential threats. Thank you. BBZ79 can unmute and go ahead. Good, afternoon. Good evening, Dr. Koff. It's Kaushik again. I'm sorry to bother you with another question. Please. Um, is, is it in the chat or what do you mean? Which uh, question? I believe. Uh... He has uh, lost yes, the uh, connection. Not. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Sorry for the Sorry. connection issue. I just wanted to know the measures which are taken of these illegal trades and if there are any other measures taken to check these illegal trades before going into another country. Um, yeah, the regulations. I mean, it depends on each country. Um, these, these regulations, and we have these international uh, regulations that, like CITES. Um, but the quota for exporting products and skins of or also li uh, live specimens, these quotas are just made, I don't know, arbitrarily. So um, there has never been an investigation. Um, studying if these quotas are sustainable or not, or how, or how the natural populations are affected. So um, um, it's amazing that uh, yeah, the water monitors in Indonesia, they can still persist, although nearly half a million um, specimens are legally killed ex each year. And this is, yeah, as I mentioned, just probably due to their possibility to adapt to a human environment like rice fields and so on, but I'm not sure um, how long this species might uh, persist under this severe threat. So this is all Thank not you known. Very much. Thank you, Doctor, uh, for uh, answering my second question also. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Andre. Andre Dr. Andre, I have a suggestion uh, and also to the student coordinators. If we have uh, Shreya also present her view on the Indian perspective, and if both the speakers are uh, there, and we can have a Q&A session addressing the questions to both the speakers so that we can hear the Indian perspective also. And at the end, if there is a Q&A session, the questions can be posed to both the speakers. Uh, whoever wishes to answer, we'll leave it to the speakers or both of them can contribute. Is that OK, Dr. Andre and Shreya? Sure. Yeah, thank you. With that, uh, Abhishek, uh, we will uh, proceed with the webinar, the uh, follow up. And uh, I believe there's a video to be played and then introducing Shreya and then we will uh, listen the Indian perspective and have uh, a Q&A session addressing both our speakers of the day. Thank you. OK, thank you, sir, for answering the questions. So now I request Yashwan to play the video. Yashwan, go ahead. Um, is my screen visible? Yes, we can see your screen.
थैंक यू सो मच यशवंत फॉर प्लेइंग द वीडियो ना आई रिक्वेस्ट अजय अजय टू इंट्रोड्यूस सेकंड स्पीकर हेलो इसमें ऑडियो कैन यू हियर मी यस वी कैन हियर यू अजय हां या सो आवर सेकंड स्पीकर फॉर द डे इज श्रेया भट्टाचार्य who has completed her graduate studies in wildlife conservation and management from Zen Isfahan University Hungary and have been studying the indian varanic species for the past 6 years so we are happy to have you here ma'am and you may now take over the session okay thank you should i uh, share my screen yes ma'am Can you see anything? Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. We can see your yes, screen. Okay. Uh, can you see in the slideshow mode as well? No, ma'am. I don't think so. The slideshow is working. Okay. Now, now can you see anything? Yes, ma'am. Ah, uh, can you just change the slides? Yeah. uh sorry ma'am this is in the first slide sir never mind else uh do it this way. okay so good afternoon everyone and uh, thank you so much for inviting me uh, for this talk today uh, so my topic is about the coexistence exploitation and conservation of monitor deserts from an indian perspective so uh, till now dr andre uh, explained the global perspective so now let's come to the indian perspective so uh, first i would like to give you an introduction about the the biogeographic zones of india and uh, the background from which uh, the species are prone to exploitation in india so firstly uh, india is one of the 17 mega diverse countries of the world and uh, it has one of the biggest populations of uh, human of human populations in the world and apart from that we have a lot of uh, wildlife as well uh, there are a lot of biogeographic zones there are different kind of ecosystems and habitats as well uh, this is from the national biodiversity action plan 2019 the picture which you can see um, on the slide so now as you can see that the flora and fauna uh, the estimation in 2014 and 2018 uh, according to the nba They, it is continuously increasing and uh, that way considering the population considering the modernization considering all the aspects of it and also considering this fact that the uh, that that the wild species are increasing i mean it's it's more or less being discovered so that way uh, it's a huge threat to preserve this natural uh, ecosystems natural habitats as well as the species so uh, now coming to some of the common threats uh, that are there what the most important threat is the habitat degradation uh, and deforestation as uh, dr andre mentioned previously and uh, there is habitat encroachment there is trade so the first picture which you can see is the filling up of a wetland uh, wetlands constitute a very important part of an ecosystem and there are several uh, species there are several eco there are several food chains that exist uh, inside a wetland even a small marshland that is uh, that that can be found near maybe some um, degraded land or maybe some construction site but we often tend to ne neglect the fact that there exists a huge ecosystem uh, there exists species as well so blocking or uh, filling up of wetlands can cause a huge threat to the small patches of ecosystems uh, small patches of uh, living species the second picture constitutes the uh, deforestation you can see the burning and burning of forests and the third one is the trade which is uh, increasing on a global perspective as well as from india as well so now coming to the perspective of the monitor lizards 
in India. So in India, we have four species of monitor lizards, the water monitor, the common water monitor, Varanus salvator, the yellow monitor, Varanus flavescens, uh, the Bengal monitor, Varanus bengalensis, and the desert monitor, Varanus griseus. So uh, the IUCN's red list status of the first one, the Varanus uh, salvator is least concerned, uh, but the others are the yellow monitor is uh, endangered, um, the Bengal monitor is near threatened and the desert one is uh, least desert one is also least concerned okay, so uh, gradually the the population of the species are decreasing in several parts of india uh, my work is focused in west bengal because i have been studying the um, monitor lizards in west bengal for the past 5 to 6 years hence i can talk about the perspective from uh, from the state from the state perspective from west bengal so uh, Coming to the case study, there's, there's a case study which I have conducted in 2015. Uh, this was in, uh, in West Bengal, which is uh, near Kolkata, uh, 20 kilometers from uh, Joka. Joka is a place uh, at, in South 24 Parganas. Uh, this is the Google Earth image of uh, Chokmani Gram Panchayat. This is a small village which consists of a lot of uh, wetlands, as you can see. From the image i'm not sure if, if it's visible enough but from the satellite image you can see that there are a lot of like segregated 20 to 25 uh, small wetlands in in this particular area uh, so when i went to this place when i was studying my uh, bachelor's in 2015 and uh, to my surprise it was a very special there was a very special situation in this particular village which i'll come come to it uh, we published this uh, work in 2018 along with uh, Andre. And uh, so basically, I would I would like to give you a short description of what this place offered. So as you can see that there are a lot of segregated wetlands here. Uh, these wetlands were preserved, uh, kind of preserved since ancient times, according to the villagers. And the reason for this preservation was due to the fact that there were superstitious beliefs um, traditional taboos that were attached to these wetlands. Uh, these, these were considered as um, some kind of holy or uh, in some cases there's a, the people were scared because of some deaths and some robberies happening in this particular area. Uh, there are some temples as well, uh, ancient Durga temples which were um, dated back to maybe hundreds, 100 to 150 years of age. And those areas, uh, people are very scared to use this particular uh, marshlands. So uh, approximately there are 20 segregated marshlands and from them, 12 of them, as far as I remember, were uh, not used by the local people. And uh, since those, those areas were not used, not at all utilized by the local people, there existed very special kind of ecosystem and uh, a large amount of water monitor lizards was found in this particular area. Uh, as you can see that this is placed in South 24 Parganas of uh, West Bengal. If we go more downwards, uh, there's a Sundarban area. So apart from the Sundarban area, uh, I think this particular area consisted of the maximum amount of water monitor lizards. So, uh, so why and how this kind of population existed in this only in this village and not in the surroundings. So uh, the reason was very, uh, I'll come to the reason. So the objectives, what were the objectives of our study? The first objective was to understand how uh, the traditional beliefs help to conserve the marshlands. Uh, and the- oh, Sorry, sorry to interrupt, uh, yeah. Yes. Okay, the slides aren't moving. Yeah, now it's moving. Yeah, please find it. If uh, you are unsharing the, uh, slide and resume so that we can have a, a let's attempt a show can come okay so shall i stop sharing and then share again yes let's, let's uh, make an attempt uh, let's share yeah okay just a second Okay, so I stopped sharing it. Yes, yes. Can you 
is it uh, can you see it now it is being shared abhishek okay. can you no, confirm shall i continue mm -hmm. yeah it's in the not in the full screen mode okay it's not happening we proceed okay please go ahead okay thank you uh okay so the main objectives of this study was to understand the traditional beliefs um, and the second one was to comprehend the mutual benefits and the co-occurrence between the varanids and the villages the monotelizers and the villages uh, seem to occur very uh, mutually symbiotically in this particular village and uh, that was a very reason that why uh, we studied this uh, this village so basically what we found is uh, you can see that these are the marshlands which are completely uh, abandoned and uh, preserved for the past uh, 50 to 60 years at least uh, so the first image is of the water hyacinth infestation of water hyacinth uh, in this particular pond and uh, the the downward image is of the burrows this is a burrow of a, of a water monitor lizard here so the water monitors are the second largest uh, monitor lizards after the komodo uh, hence living with the villages of with uh, the water monitor lizard is a very questionable thing and that was the reason why uh, why we conducted the study and, and it came to my mind that why how the villages are tolerating such huge reptiles so uh, the situation was you can see the second uh, slide shows the these are some of the pictures of the water monitor lizards in this particular area so it seems from the study that uh, the there are a lot of poultry farms in this particular village and uh, there is a main canal since it is in the south 24 parganas there is a canal that goes and mix with the hugli river and further to bay of bengal from the image if you can see so these poultry farmers they used to throw the poultry wests in this particular uh, there the, there is a canal that that runs throughout the village and they used to throw this uh, this poultry waste like poultry feathers and uh, other wastes into this canal and uh, that is the reason how this water monitor lizards got attracted and they feed on this but on this uh, poultry wastes so uh, it seems that there exists a very mutual uh, occur mutually mutual benefits between both the reptiles as well as the villagers because otherwise if you have to dump the uh, dump the poultry waste in a particular place um, that would take those that that would take that would consume time but obviously that is not a advisable thing to throw uh, waste in into the canals but whatever that's how the uh, system was was has been for the past uh, past 50 to 60 years and that is the reason how, why the villages tolerate the monitor lizards and there are instances instances where the lizards get inside the inside their houses or uh, near their poultry farms but they do not kill them and uh, the interesting fact is that in west bengal uh, i'll come to that point later on that there are uh, several hunting festivals and local utilizations but still in this particular village uh, the villagers do not let the people to uh, outsiders to enter and uh, you know in not even harm the uh, monitor lizards so so these are some of the methodology and results uh, semi structured questionnaires were conducted um, for 50 respondents of various age groups inside the village and 98% of the respondents supported the conservation of the marshlands uh, they supported one of the reason is because uh, the monitors stay there as well as they do not i think till now they are not uh, modernization driven they are not driven to modernization uh, maybe this is applicable to the older generation as the young generation will come into play maybe they they would want to sell off the lands or maybe would like to uh, build houses or factories or whatever in the coming days but presently uh, though these are all uh, preserved and due to the superstitious values uh, and the second one is the 96% were in favor of the conservation of monitor lizards um, that is because of the mutual benefits as i explained before so this was about the chokmanik case study now coming to the local utilization and hunting festivals um, 
local utilizations in every part of west bengal there are local utilizations unfortunately even uh, even there is uh, due to the, the even there is this uh, law indian uh, wildlife protection act of india irrespective of the uh, indian wildlife protection act of india 1972 where uh, the monitor lizards all all these four species of monitor lizards are protected under schedule 1 part 2 and uh, those should be given the same protection as our national ti- national uh, animal tiger but still uh, in every parts wherever i visited in west bengal there are local utilizations there are um, killings there are festivals uh, there are entertainment killings uh, which is which is a very uh, questionable reference if if that is justifiable or not uh, as well as there are uh, monitor lizards are utilized for meat purposes for food as well so you can see in this first picture these are four species of uh, varanus flavescens during a hunting festival and this kid is hardly i think 15 to 16 years of age and uh, what and varanus flavescens is listed this year uh, in 2018 assessment varanus flavescens is listed as endangered but even if when it is listed as endangered there is a lot of utilization still happening in various parts of uh, india the second image is of same the skin of varanus flavescens dried skin of varanus flavescens uh, this is in a village in birbhum district of west bengal and uh, the skin the dried skin is used for several purposes it has medicinal purposes it has uh, instruments medi- musical instruments are made from the skins so uh, it's there's a huge threat to this uh, reptiles in the indian subcontinent it seems so irrespective of the fact that there are several laws and uh, actions being taken uh the second Im- this image is very interesting image uh, this was one during one of my service field service uh, this is a project by uh, the iucn ssc monitor lizard specialist group i'll come to that later on uh this is the fat the first picture is the fat of monitor lizard belly fat and the second one is the oil uh, this has medicinal uh, properties what they do the the tribesmen of the santal tribesmen there's a tribe called santal which is widely spread widespread in several parts of birbhum as well as in west bengal jharkhand urissa i think in several parts of india you can find this tribe and uh, the oil is of high medicinal property for them as well as for uh, the non tribesmen also uh, so what they do is they collect the belly fat of the monitor lizard and then they burn it uh, they heat it and they burn it so there are two kinds of uh, ways to preserve it one is that you just you can just put that uh, inside a bottle and let it you know uh, shed the oil over time and the second one is you you burn it uh, in in heat and then you get this clear oil so this was very surprising for me um, and the most most um, interesting part is uh, they are unaware of the fact that this species are protected in india and not only monitor lizards but several other species like jungle cats which is which is also protected under under schedule 1 of wildlife protection act of india are utilized um the squirrels are utilized there i you name it there are a lot of things so uh, it's very it's it's very sad uh, and a very horrible situation um uh, yes so we are trying to project from iucn uh, mlsg we are trying to project this document and uh, this kind of uh, activities so to so to aware the local people the second one uh, this is these are some of the arrows and catapult uh, the bow and arrow these are used to hunt pigs and boars wild boars and also jungle cats uh, they are openly using snares in the urban areas birbhum uh, this area is not even uh, a forest area this is a normal uh, my field study where i go for visiting is just a normal village and uh, people are openly putting snares for catching foxes catching jackals sorry uh, jungle cats as well as their their hunting monitor lizards whenever they find it and they just kill it the meat is uh, known as a delicacy and the oil is known as a healing uh, medicine for any kind of wounds whether that's open wound or um, rheumatism or any other kind of wounds uh, this is a very another interesting fact is that uh, most of these tribesmen do not visit pharmacies 
do not go to uh, medicine shops for their uh, daily, uh, you know, uh, treatments. So what they do is whenever there is some healing or something, uh, there, there is some cut or something, they just uh, get the oil and put it there. So in most of the houses, you will find this kind of oils and other things. So uh, this is a catapult. The second image is of a catapult. Um, this is used for hunting birds. The They dry the, they make small balls with soils and dry them like in the sun and that becomes extremely hard. So they aim any bird, uh, whether that's a minor, common minor or a stork, or there are a lot of migratory birds that come to this place because here there are a lot of uh, wetlands in Birbhum. So they just hunt them and they just eat it. So it is actually a very unfortunate and horrible situation. So uh, this is a tribesman, uh, a Santal tribesman very proudly demonstrating the fact that how he hunts and how he holds the bow and arrow. Actually, he was trying to teach me. Um, since I was doing the survey, I have to be friendly with them and I have to know their ways of uh, living and their perceptions. The second one is the uh, monitor lizards being hunted during a uh, hunting festival in India, in West Bengal. This was documented by NGO Heal. So, uh, the most important part of this conflict is that uh, we just cannot go to the field and blame the people, blame the tribesmen or blame, blame the local people that you're killing a particular species or you're utilizing a particular species. The most important thing is that uh, they do not know that these are protected. There is a very less uh, awareness that has been provided to them. They are not aware of any of the laws. They are not aware that these species are getting um, reducing in populations, the population trends are decreasing and what are the effects that can come into play. So I think uh, from a very broad perspective, awareness is the first thing that should be uh, provided to these people. And as well as several programs, government um, forest department programs should be conducted in several uh, rural areas, rural, rural areas of um, India, actually, because uh, even in small pockets, even there are some very small pockets of villages, there exists a very high biodiversity, which we often tend to ignore. And uh, that can really cause a huge threat to our uh, wildlife population as a whole. So now coming to the part of Hathajori. Uh, this was a very interesting publication. Hathajori is the illegal trade of monitor lizard genitalia. Uh, back in 2018, I remember I was in Hungary and uh, Andre wrote to me that, do you know anything about Hatha Jori? And maybe, we, it, maybe you can search about it and we can write something about it. And uh, the first thing I searched in, Hat, in, in the internet from Hungary about Hatha Jori, I came across this image. <laughs> it's like Hatha Jori is $54, $54.99 US dollars and it can be um, it can reach Hungary in within maybe two or three days. That's that was what uh, it was written, and it was free shipping. So I was very curious that how can uh, if it is a if it is regulated from India, then how can uh, Hathajori reach Hungary so easily without any kind of customs and any kind of uh, uh, you know problems, illegal uh, wildlife trafficking problems. So we gradually went through it and studied more about it. This is another site and it was widely available through any site, whether that's eBay or Snapdeal or uh, Flipkart or you name any site, everywhere it was available and there's a whole lot of description that what is Hatha Jodi, how uh, Hatha Jodi can be used. And uh, the interesting part is it's written that is this is the plant root of, uh, this is a plant root of what that was not written in every particular ad but it was written that this is a plant root and it can uh, benefit in several ways. This is the this is one of the images from eBay. Uh, as you can see, it's written that it's very rare and useful for happiness, wealth, prosperity, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, worship rituals, tantra, and so on. So, second thing that came to our mind was how this trade got regulated and how uh, so easily a monitor lizard genitalia got traded as hatha jori. So this is the image uh, which which shows the 
hemipenis of monitor lizard, which is actually treated as uh, hathajori plant root. No, uh, deceptive way of trading uh, <clears throat> the hathajori. So after that, we came across uh, every everywhere it was written that this is a plant root of Martinia annua. Martinia annua is a plant uh, which is of high Ayurvedic importance in India. Uh, so these were some of the publications that that we found from the internet. Um, this is wound healing effect of flavonoid ridge fraction, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, but the the interesting fact was in uh, previous literature there were evidences that monitor lizards um, fat can heal uh, inflammation as well. So it was very interesting that uh, how this the the misused scientific facts of Martinia annua can be related in a way with Hatha, with with the monitor lizards. So, um, for example, if we very, very naturally, if we want to, you know, search for Martini Annua, benefits of Martini Annua, you can search in the internet and you can find several, several publications where uh, there are evident results of medicinal properties of this particular plant root. And uh, for any for any person, it's not possible to understand that Hatha Jori is a genitalia of monitor lizard. This is very difficult for anybody to understand. And once and if it is written in Hathajuri that uh, in the description of Hathajuri that yes, it can be used in medicinal purposes. And uh, I searched the internet and found so many publications. Obviously, I'll order it. Uh, that's how natural it is. But uh, behind that, behind that layer, behind that uh, curtain, there lies very brutal truth of utilization of exploitation. And uh, this is what it is. And that's how we uh, wrote our publication on. Uh, this illegal trade, huge illegal trade, which is curbing now, I think, which is uh, which uh, which has stopped in the present days. So this is how it looks. Uh, Martini annua seeds resembling claws. This is called tiger claws also. Uh, Hatha jodi means closed claws in Hindi. That's how uh, it's called Hatha jodi. So this is basically a whole deception uh, game behind the trade. So now coming to the part of conservation through awareness workshop campaigns or programs. Uh, this is one of the most important part, um, I think, because uh, in several parts, as I already explained, that uh, awareness is not being promoted. Uh, people are not aware of several things. So in 2019, with the help of uh, IUC and SSC Multilizard Specialist Group and uh, EAES, uh, Environment, Agriculture and Education Society, that is a local NGO based in Bareilly. We conducted this uh, awareness workshops in five districts of West Bengal. This is the uh, pamphlet, this is a brochure. We conducted uh, in one school. The main objective was to conduct in one school and college. Uh, the, 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 the districts were Hooghly, Bankura, Purulia, Birbhum, and Haura. Uh, so the target audience was uh, in primary, in uh, high school students, in high school students, the primary audience was from class nine to 12 and in college, uh, first year to third year. That's how we arranged so that we can uh, target the young audiences, uh, the youth to understand their perceptions and how to motivate them uh, and bring about a change in their thinking, in their thought process to bring about conservation. So these are some of the contents of the workshops. Um, so. We planned it in such a way that we the our main objective was to uh, get their perception as well to get a baseline data of the perceptions of the students in several districts, because uh, we think that it's not possible to change a mindset by only you know uh, showing a presentation or trying to get information uh, trying to give information to the people to change any to change any mindset or to motivate anybody we need to know their perception at first and then uh, try to motivate them based on their perceptions which we got. So uh, at first questionnaires were distributed to several uh, students in this particular uh, colleges or schools. Uh, our the total strength was more than 1000. It was 1062. Uh, the total uh, students where we conducted the workshops. So first we were we distributed uh, questionnaires which consisted of uh, the following themes presence of biodiversity, the present. These were all MCQ questions, some qualitative. 
the perceptions like what how where do you live for example uh, say in this in the district of hugli what is your perception of the biodiversity presence high low moderate or you don't know that that was the kind of questionnaire pattern to know exactly how the uh, how they are perceiving the biodiversity the wildlife the wetlands around them uh, then gradually we moved towards the monitor lizards um, this was all in, as part of the questionnaire the presence respondents attitude towards the species uh, this was very interesting because in several in several districts we got uh, the the mcqs for this question was uh, your attitude can be negative positive negative or neutral so people where uh, districts where there are ma maximum conflicts people uh, opted for negative so that's how we got to know the baseline data that how uh, the perceptions evolved in this particular areas and uh, how we can uh, maybe motivate or change that and also we we addressed the case of hathajori also in this in this five districts hunting is also there as well so after that we got a 40 minute uh, presentation slide um, based on several uh, perspectives several topics such as the general description of biodiversity wildlife conservation importance of wetlands whatever questions we asked if you can uh, see whatever questions we asked in the beginning to the students we addressed the same things in our presentation we tried to describe we tried to introduce them to the wildlife protection act of india uh to the iucn ss model is specialist group uh to the illegal trade of hatajori everything that was there in in the first slide uh it was very unfortunate uh, that even students in third year of bsc zoology uh could not uh, they went they did not know about the wildlife protection act of india 1972 uh so if so our concern was my con i mean that was a very big concern that if the students who are studying zoology do not know the importance of the wildlife protection act of india what can you expect from the farmers and the agriculture uh, laborers and exploitation happens from this particular grassroots level and it's very important to reach the grassroots level people to encourage conservation otherwise uh, otherwise if researchers are studying conservation and reporting them or, or documenting them nothing's going to change in the uh, on the ground and that is very important that's what i feel so uh, that's how uh, the descriptions were given and after that there was an interaction uh, with the students so they had uh, and it and it's also very surprising because i did not expected so much of uh, questions coming from the young minds the students this this was a girl school in purulia and uh, the students were in 8th to 9th standard as far as i remember uh, sorry not a girl school quid as i can see guy the boys also but they they had so much of questions you know they they were asking uh, they had lot of questions related to everything um, like how monitor lizards can help in preserving ecosystem or why we should not kill them so uh, that is very important thing that we need to spark this thing in, in the young minds to ask them to make them ask questions that how why when and uh, if the if the nation has to grow the young minds should come up otherwise it's very very difficult to promote research or conservation so these are some of the glimpses of the workshops uh this this was in purulia hugli hugli district as well uh the second image th this image the third image clockwise sorry anti clockwise the third image if you can see uh the, in this particular school they did not have a slide show uh, i mean a projector so we had to get a projector on our own and get the setup done there and they did and it was summer and they did not even have a fan so uh, so but when we presented the whole workshop uh, the the ideas of of it and uh, very simple things that how uh, a pad, paddy farm can uh, you know uh, conserve uh, monitor lizards and they 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 are telling me that okay uh, we have seen our fathers are farmers and we have seen so many monitor lizards but we never knew that uh, these are important and they need to be conserved so that's how i think uh, conservation should enter the grassroots level and uh, young people so this is these are some of the results uh, so there were a majority of the feedback responses which we got i i don't remember if i explained you after the after the uh, questions and answers we we distributed a follow up feedback questionnaire 
which uh, ask their which address the same uh, questions that if your if your perception has changed or if you still believe the same or not. So from that analysis, we got very positive feedback responses regarding their attitudes with monitor, towards monitor lizards, um, whether monitor lizards should be protected or not, and the and and so on. And the third one was, was if you have used multi lizard paths before, would you do so again in the future or not? So uh, most of the answers regarding this question about the use of multi lizard paths were yes from almost a uh, majority of the students in the in the several schools and colleges. And it was very surprising to see that later on uh, in the feedback results, they said that no, they won't. So I think that uh, it was a success. The workshops were a success. And uh, this was the average values of all participants whose changes uh, in attitude regarding monitor lizards after the workshop. So you can see that this was a total value. 92.95% um, said that they have better perceptions, better attitudes than before, uh, which is, I think, a huge achievement from our part. Uh, and we are currently working on the, on the detailed description of this data. And maybe soon we will be publishing the same. In 2020, we got funding, successfully received funding from uh, Zoological Survey for the Conservation of Species and Population, Germany. Um, they were very kind enough uh, to give us a fine funding, but unfortunately, due to the pan pandemic situation in uh, India, we had to cancel it. Maybe we'll be doing the same in the next few years, coming years. Uh, the ongoing work, which is right now, which uh, we are working on, is a local is a project on the local utilization patterns of wildlife species, especially on multi lizards in the Santal villages of Birbhum, West Bengal, India. This is a project of IUCN Monitor Lizard Specialist Group, and uh, the results which I've showed you before were some of uh, the results from this field work as well. Yeah, and uh, finally, acknowledgments. Uh, I'm the first one, the first person to thank for all my. Uh, studies till now is Dr. Andre Koch uh, for his support and guidance throughout the beginning of my career since 2016. The first time when I contacted him uh, with my study on the monitor, water monitor lizards of Chokmanik. Uh, from then, since now, he has been guiding me and helping me through everything, <laughs> whatever, whatever projects or whatever crazy ideas that I come through is there for me. <laughs> So I'm extremely thankful to him. Uh, I'm grateful to Dr. Mark uh, and IUCN HSC Multi Lizard Specialist Group for all the support and guidance. Um, I'm thankful to the members of volunteers of EAS. Um, they have helped a lot for the coordination and uh, implementation of the uh, awareness workshop projects in 2019 and 2020 also with, with um, the successfully writing the proposal and submitting it to ZGAP. Uh, also, I'm very thankful to ZGAP, um, Zoological Survey for Conservation of Species and Populations, for supporting and uh, providing funding for our workshops, which unfortunately could not be uh, manifested in 2020. But we are hopeful for uh, the next ventures as well. And thank you so much for your patience and uh, attention. So this is my mail ID and my research kit profile. In case you want to get in touch with me, please feel free. Thank you, ma'am, for the informative talk. It was really interesting. We learned a lot. Thank you. Now the panel is open up for questions. Students can either raise their hands, unmute and ask, or text down the questions in the chat. Uh, just to continue with uh, where we had stopped, there was this question in the chat box to both uh, Dr. Andre and Shreya. Uh, how many species are venomous among the Varanids? Um, yeah, first of all, thank you very much, uh, Shreya, for this great talk. It's um, amazing what you've been doing there in India so far, and I hope we can continue this in the future as well. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, coming back to the question. Um, uh, regarding the the venom, um, that's a good question, and um, it has been studied first in the Komodo dragon, 
because this is the only species which is able to um, kill larger prey, larger mammals also. And um, but at the same time, these authors they showed that nearly all uh, lizards in general have the um, have these glands and the ability to produce um, venom in their um, saliva glands. But um, if they if it's expressed or how it's used, this is not really um, investigated yet. So there are some observations that bites from, I think, the desert monitor that lead to um, effects of the envenomation. <laughs> I don't know if this is the correct word, um, but uh, this is um, not really studied for most species. Uh, yeah, Abhishek, uh, go ahead. My question is, what is the reason for tropical, uh, more so Southeast Asian distribution of Viranids? Um, if I may also answer, this is just a typical pattern for the global biodiversity distribution that you find the highest species number in the tropics. So, and in, in, in specifically in the tropical rainforest and the tropical um, coral reefs, these are the most uh, species diverse uh, ecosystems on the planet. And the further you go to the north or to the south, um, reaching the polar regions, biodiversity <clears throat> decreases significantly. So this is, um, yeah, it depends not just on the temperature, but this certainly influences the, uh, influences the diversity, also of monotelism diversity. Uh, the next question from the chat is about uh, uh, 21 CBZ56 wants to know about this ancient uh, varanid known as Megalania and their morphology and how are they related to Komodo dragons? Yeah, Megalania um, is a mortal lizard that lived in Australia. I th I'm not sure when it died out some thousand years ago. Um, and this was probably more than four meters long, um, based on the, uh, the 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 bones and skull fragments which were found. And um, um, but you have to know that in Australia in former times there were also mammals which were much larger. There was a giant kangaroo, for instance. I think it was more than two meters or something. Um, and all, nearly all these giant species, they died out, um, like was also the case in uh, in Europe and Asia, like the mammoth and the, those species of the ice ages. And this was either due to the climate change or also to the arrival and the spread of the human species. So I think Australia was uh, colonized also about 40,000 years ago. And um, after this, time um, Megalania died out and um, all, also other um, huge mammal species for instance so so very certainly yeah the people killed them because they were afraid or because they ate them and Megalania was a close relative of uh, the Komodo dragon yes that's true uh, I believe in uh, relation to same uh, John 21 sees at 36. I hope I read out it properly. The monitor lizard bromate, which is hibernation like state to handle uh, temperature extremes. So does higher temperature due to global warming affect us? I believe he is citing a situation where four monitor lizards were disturbed during this and they died of shock. So. 21 Cs at 36, would you like to elaborate on that? Did I read out the question properly? Uh, yes. Okay. That's pretty much it. Okay. So like, don't, don't they have to go through a state where they have to, when temperature extremes get really high, they have to like, uh, kind of like a hibernation state, I think, they have to go to. Uh, I mean, they, yeah. Uh, they put they like slow down the metabolism to like, but they still continue to feed and all that during that time. 
and I read something about like poor monitor lizards in a zoo dying because of shock once they were disturbed during that. Um, yeah, although monitor lizards are adapted to tropical temperatures, um, they have a, a, a yeah specific range. As any species has a range where it feels good, like like we also do. When it becomes too hot, we start sweating. And if it's getting even hotter and we don't find shade and do not drink enough, we can also get a shock and and uh, a heat shock and die. And so this happens and may happen in, in each um, species, also in plants, of course. And um, so, yeah, they, they try to avoid these extreme high and extreme low temperatures, which they are not, uh, which are not um, suitable for them. So um, if it's too hot, they may yeah, make like a hibernation um, period just in, in summer and they may um, hide into their burrows and wait until temperature uh, decreases and it becomes more humid perhaps again. Okay. Uh, the next question is to Shreya, does the Indian context that uh, BBZ69 has posted. Large scale exploitation of monitor lizards is undertaken for their skins. For example, spiny tail lizard is traditionally and illegally used as aphrodisiac in uh, many parts of India and Southeast Asia. So ma'am, uh, what do you think all these practices lead? Well, will they not lead to extinction of the species? Uh, what can we do to stop this? Probably they are referring to the legislation and the awareness that you spoke of. Okay. Um, well, I think uh, the legislation, from a legislation perspective, uh, the laws are pretty, pretty strict um, according to the Wildlife Protection Act of India, uh, but implementation is not there. So that is the problem. That so there where it lacks uh, and. Uh, how can we uh, what can we do to stop this right that is the question so uh, <laughs> that's a very very confusing question because um, there are a lot of stakeholders lot of layers in which we all can contribute um, i think the first step is awareness because uh, trade in india uh, utilization in india is most of the time done without even knowing that it's something uh, it's part of crime so um, firstly, I think to make people aware that uh, this is not what is what is legal and uh, and and that is the I think the first step. Um, the other steps are proper implementation of the laws because I think the laws are pretty well structured and formed. So uh, implementation lacks and uh, I think that's how we can stop it and more people should come up. Uh, to contribute to the conservation, to prospects of conservation. If I may add to this, I think um, education is the 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 the, the central point um, to to increase the, the 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 awareness and also the conservation of any species. But uh, on the other side, if this is if there is yeah, like a poor population in a village or something, if there is no supermarket or um, anything where they can buy the groceries, I mean, they have to go to the forest um, or if they don't have some pets, perhaps like like chicken and stuff. But um, yeah, this also depends on the yeah level of education and their 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 standards. But uh, in order to, to um, make them aware that it is a protected or a threatened species, um, such awareness campaigns are really very um, important. Yes, absolutely. I think it's, it's the responsibility of the forest departments uh, in the state and several districts individually to visit these areas, for example, the tribal areas and talk to the people because nowadays there are subsidies for these people, for the tri tribal people to for getting um, rice and uh, other sources of food. They also get chicken uh, from the government. So it's, I think the lack of awareness and most of the time it's recreation also to, uh, you know, go out hunting or killing. Uh, but when it comes to the trade perspective, I think it's different. 
first trade uh, and utilization, local utilization uh, varies. The concepts varies. Uh, BBZ43, you can unmute and ask your question. Uh, hello, sir and ma'am. Uh, it's a delight to have you both. Uh, my question was that we all know that half highly intelligent monitor lizards are like, for example, like many species of them lay their eggs in termite mounds. So is there any unique behavior which you have seen which indicates the intelligence of the monitor lizards? <laughs> Try. have you made any um, observations like this? E, maybe, yeah. Uh, once during my uh, chalk manic field study, uh, there, there was there used to be two monitor water monitors in one particular pond, and uh, and initially they were very shy uh, about my presence, but later on they got to know that this person is gonna do nothing and just stand there and watch us. So later on they got used to me. So. So maybe you can say that is one of the adaptations. Yeah, I think this is um, yeah true that they quickly learn if something is threatening them or if it's um, not at all. So they become tame. Also, when you when you keep them as a pet, um, this is also true for Commodore uh, lizards, by the way. Um, I myself could just report from. Um, from looking in the eyes of a Komodo dragon in a zoo. And um, I mean, you can, it, it's different. It's not like a dog or something, although dogs are also clever creatures, but, or perhaps take a fish or something, which just uh, watch at you or not really watching at you. Um, but the Komodo dragon, he focuses on you. And um, I think this is an expression of the intelligence. And uh, there have been studies um, uh, and they revealed uh, the intelligence. I think they can even count until three. So things like this, and this is amazing for a lower vertebrate, as we call the reptiles in general. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, sir and ma'am. Uh, um, Mahindra has posted a question. Are there morphological changes uh, happening with uh, different species in different seasons? Is there a seasonal impact on the morphology of the species? Any comments on that? Hmm. Good question. But since I rarely see monitors alive, but I'm more uh, uh, because in Europe there are no monitors, and I used to work mainly on um, voucher specimens in museum collections, that's a bit difficult to say, but. Um, I mean, perhaps depending on the season, their nutrition status changes because if it's too dry in the dry season, there is nothing to eat, they will lose weight. And uh, perhaps in the rainy season, if there is abundant um, food available, they would become thicker. And uh, But I'm not aware of other differences. Shreya, you perhaps? Um. Maybe uh, the Varanus flavicens becomes more um, more bright, brighter in color. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember. Yeah. Remember the picture. Uh, yeah, true. That was very um, colorful. Yeah, because the... although, yeah, although this is a bit un, um, unusual for monitors, it's known from other reptiles also that they in the breeding seasons the males become more colorful and um but i'm not i was not aware in monitors but i think in flavescence this might be an exception yes that the males become more colorful in the breeding season well. yeah okay thank you i will take the last question for the session both of both our speakers have been answering patiently the last question is i'm clubbing two of them uh, are monitor lizards just hunted or they also bred in captivity is one. The other student is asking about how can we involve in conservation programs or initiatives. Yeah, with that, the question and answer session comes to an end. We'll wait for the answers from the speakers, please.
Um, yeah, if I may start, um, they are not just hunted. As I mentioned already, that um, a lot of biological observer observations um, derived from um, captive breeding and captive um, facilities like zoos and uh, private persons. Um, this is an important um, aspect or yeah, so they're not just killed and consumed, but also um, uh, kept as pets. But um, yeah, the other question is, is very interesting and um, I'm happy perhaps that we have motivated you to join any conservation projects. So I'm, I'm sure um, Shreya might need some help to um, continue her studies, perhaps locally, that um, might probably be a chance. And um, otherwise, I would um, recommend to contact local NGOs, like perhaps there is like a herpetology society or any other wildlife societies um, and and to to start perhaps your own project and I think everybody can contribute to monitor lizard research. Absolutely. Yeah. Exactly. Thank you both of you, uh, Dr. Andre and Shreya for these informative replies for all the queries that the participants post, uh, students and participants from different parts of the country. Thank you for your uh, uh, patient listening and answering. Yes, we would love to associate with both of you. As uh, it was said in the beginning, the Natural Science Association St. Joseph's College has launched the Josephite uh, Herpetology Club. So through that, we would love to be in touch, uh, in contact with you both and seek your expertise in future as well. So thank you for that. Uh, the next one hour is going to be presentations, poster, review posters, and the sightings of Varanid's uh, that's the presentation session. Uh, if you both could wish to stay for another hour is where five, five minutes is allocated to each of the presenter to view. Uh, I leave the choice to both of you. To thank you. Proceed. Yes, yes. So thank you. Then, then we'll move into the presentation uh, section. We have around 10 presenters. Yes. Abhishek, over to you. Thank you, for Thank you for answering the questions. We'll keep the Q&A section at the last. So with no further delay, let's start with the student's presentation. The first in order is Kaushik Kanchum Thang, who is going to speak on Komodo dragons. Kaushik, over to you. Good evening, respected, uh, respected dignitaries. I'll be sharing my screen now. And we have prepared a poster, info poster on the largest species of monitor lizards found on this earth, the Komodo dragon. I'm hoping uh, everyone is able to see my screen. So here yeah, we true. have a post. Okay, so I'll be leading with the Komodo dragons, my my teammate Chuntang and I, we have prepared an info poster on Komodo dragon. The Komodo dragon, also known as the Varanus komodoensis, is also known as the Komodo monitor, is a member of the monitor lizard family, Varenidae, that is endemic to the Indonesian islands of Komodo, Rinka Flores and Gilimotang. It is the largest extent of species of monitor lizards found on this earth, which has a maximum growing capacity of three meters in length and weighing about approximately 70 kilograms, which is 150 pounds when converted. Now, understanding about the Komodo dragon or the Varanus komodoensis, we can see that their unusual size can be attributed to a situation called as island gigantism because there are no other carnivorous animals to fill in the niche on the islands where these Komodo dragons live. When I say there are no other animals to fill in the niche, I, may, I mean to say that these Komodo dragons are the apex predators in their land. So, because uh, so they have 
unusual size, which is not common in monitor lizards seen around this planet, uh, which can be attributed to island gigantism. And this is also a case of the dragon's low met metabolic rate. And due to a result of their size, they have dominated the ecosystems where they live. And even though these dragons mostly eat car carrion, they will also hunt and ambush their prey, including vertebrates, birds and mammals. Ambush in the sense they have their mouth filled with saliva and these saliva are filled with bacteria that can infect a wound, causing the animal to die of suffocation. And this suffocation period is not within a day or two. It can be within two to three days, leading the animal to leading its prey to die in a very in a very painful situation. Now, coming to the ma mating of Komodo dragons, we generally know that these lizards show parthenogenesis. But obviously, parthenogenesis is not the only form of mating in these Komodo dragons. And obviously, we need a pair for sexually reprodu reproducing animals and Komodo dragons are one. So mating begin, begins between May and August. And when these eggs are laid in September, there are about 20 to 30 eggs deposited in a megapo, uh, uh, deposited in abandoned megapod nets and incubated for seven to eight months, which which means that these eggs will be hatch will be hatching in will be hatching during the months of April to May, when these these are the time these are the times when these young ones will be vulnerable to the most. Uh, in the poster, we can see the habitat range of the Komodo dragons, uh, parthenogenesis. Uh, Steve Irwin's son, Robert Irwin, with his Komodo dragon from the zoo in Sydney, a hatchling, and two male Komodo dragons fighting with each other for mating rights. And now when I come to talk about the cultural emotion these emo Komodo dragons bring to the indigenous tribes of Komodo in Indonesia, People, uh, they say that these animals are of the most importance to their existing ecosystem because being uh, apex predators, they keep the culture and the population and the population number of the prey in tandem with how with how every food web should be, food web and food network should be in which can also lead to conflicts with farmers and their cattle. The main reason for uh, conflict between farmers and these dragons are when they come in contact with their livestock. As I told, as I had mentioned before, Komodo dragons ambush their prey. So whenever they see livestock, li uh, these livestock animals, when I say livestock, I mean to say cows and buffaloes. They are not that much. Uh, they aren't that much developed to be in the wild because of all the domestication process that has happened over the past millions of years. So they have lost all their ability to sense in any danger. Other than their, other than their, their sense of hearing, because the only sense they have in a hundred, which is a hundred percent, is their sense of hearing, 
and which can lead to a decrease in their numbers. This is because why these farmers go out and hunt these dragons, which can lead to a decrease in the numbers. As Dr. Andre Kosh had already mentioned, there, there are also cases where these animals are illegally hunted for their skin, for medicinal purposes as well as for recreational purposes. And the Komodo Islands and the Komodo Island in Indonesia is one of the best places to visit for a trip. Because here in Komodo Islands, you we only not we not only get to see the world's remaining population of the Komodo dragons, we also see the rich marine life of these of this island and has many stunning hiking routes, traditional villages and cultural encounters, encounters on the Mesa Island, an amazing pink beach, and the sunsets. Thank you for listening to me, and hopefully, uh, and hoping uh, you all enjoyed my presentation. Thank you. That was really a good talk, Kaushik. Uh, the next presenter is YSK Shivani, and her topic is Pathogenesis in Varanids. Shivani, over to you. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm uh, Shivani from St. Joseph's College, and uh, I will be doing an info poster presentation on Parthenogenesis in Varanids. So what is parthenogenesis? It is a process in which an unfertilized egg develops to maturity. This process has been found in 70 species of vertebrates, including captive snakes and monitor lizard species. In most of these reptile cases, this is their only method of reproduction. We can find uh, parthenogenesis uh, in uh, monitor uh, lizard species, uh, such as uh, Komodo dragons, Varanus panoptus horni, Varanus ornatus, Varanus uh, penoptus, and others. In this process, uh, both the males and the females carry out uh, meiosis uh, to form four, four egg uh, progenitor cells. In females, four egg cells are produced, and one becomes the egg, while the other three get reabsorbed by the female's body. The offspring is uh, not a clone as there is ge genetic uh, recombination taking place during meiosis. Uh, all the resultant uh, hatchlings are male and this kind of uh, parthenogenesis is known as the arenotoki uh, parthenogenesis. All the um, resulting offsprings are male in such cases. This uh, phenomenon may be explained by the type of the sex chromosomes present in the monitor lizards. Monitor lizards have the ZW type of sex determination in which the females have uh, the ZW chromosomes and are uh, heterogametic in nature and the males have the uh, ZZ chromosomes and are homogametic in nature. During uh, parthenogenesis, both the sex chromosomes originate from the female's chromosome set and therefore only two variations are possible, the WW or the ZZ. Since uh, zygotes with uh, two W chromosomes are not viable, zygotes with two Z chromosomes can develop, thus producing male progeny. This uh, type of reproduction uh, comes with uh, disadvantages. The offspring uh, resulting uh, from the mating between a mother and one of her parthenogenic uh, sons can uh, decrease genetic diversity by about 50 to 60 percent. This could have a negative uh, impact on small populations such as uh, uh, Komodo dragons and their ability to adapt uh, to changing environmental conditions. Since the genetic information will not change from one generation to the next, existing DNA defects cannot uh, probably cannot be repaired. Adaptation to abrupt environmental changes is also highly unlikely because individuals from such a population have uh, nearly identical gene pods. 
harmful recessive mutations which can be marked in the heterozygous uh, condition could become homozygous and operative offspring mortality rate could be very high all hatchlings produced are male when we talk about the advantages of uh, this kind of uh, uh, reproduction uh, since the males can grow up and mate with their mothers they there would potentially be a population um, which is able to produce normally on a new island hence the main advantage of the automatic parthenogenesis parthenogenesis may be the ability to colonize new insular habitats reached by unfertilized females such a female could produce a male companion for itself or for other females coming to the same location in the future following this normal sexual reproduction Uh, could increase the population size the loss of genetic diversity could also be compensated with more individuals migrating to the, these uh, isolated populations thank you thank you shivani on the next in line is mahendra devanta and dr jay shankar they will speak on incidence of the common monitor lizards varanas bengalensis in abur road rajasthan india over to you sir uh good afternoon uh, sorry for technical some technical issue i given my presentation after one after give me uh, some sorry for technical issue hello yes sir sure yes sir sir yeah sure i will sure, try to throw the my laptop then i will be there yes sir thank you sir you want to do afterwards mahendra after the after another student finishes okay or you are sharing the slide now when i try to share with my laptop but uh, there is some uh, slow down okay, of my laptop the next speaker after the next speaker you can join yes sure sir okay. Yes, sir. Thank you. Now calling out the next speaker, Shri uh, Shri Vant and Manjari, and they will be speaking on Varanasi of India. Over to you guys. Is my screen visible? Yes, it is. Okay. Good evening to one and all present out here. I, Manjiri Prasad, along with my partner Sirivan from Saint Joseph's College, are going to present our poster on Varanids of India. Varanidae is an ancient group of anguinomorph lizards comprising about fifty to sixty species into the genus Varanus. Varanids are found in Africa, Central and Southern Mainland Asia, and Malaysian and Indonesian islands. Monitor lizards are reputed to be among the most intelligent lizards. Most spe species forage widely and have large home ranges, and many have high stamina. Although most species are carnivorous, three arboreal species in the Philippines are primarily frugivores. Among species of living varanids, the limbs show positive allometry, being larger in larger-bodied species. Although the feet become smaller as compared with the lengths of the other limb segments, varanids possess unidirectional pulmonary air flow, including air sacs similar to those of birds. About eighty species are recognized around the world, and four of them are found from India. We will now talk about the different types of varanids found in India. The first being Asian water monitor, also called as Malayan. Malayan water monitor or common water monitor are found along the Indo-China border and north east of India. They are dark brown or blackish with yellow spots on underside which gradually disappears with age. They have a blackish band with yellow edges extending back from each eye. They are the world's second heaviest lizard after the Komodo dragon. The second Bengal monitor also known as common Indian monitor are widely distributed throughout the indian subcontinent they have external nostril openings that is slit like 
and positioned between the eye and the snout tip. Young monitor lizards are more colorful, having series of dark crossbars on neck, throat, and back. They have a keen eyesight and can detect human movement nearly 250 meters away. I request Sirivan to take over now, who will talk about the next two types of varanids. Thank you, Manjari. Hello, I am Sirivan, and I'll be talking about the uh, other two species of uh, varanids found in India. The third one is the desert monitor. Desert monitors are an endangered species found in Gujarat, Rajasthan, Uttar Pradesh, Delhi, and Haryana. They display a variety of body colorations from gray, light brown, and yellow to gray. They have three to five bands on back, th 13 to 19 bands on tail, and have a plain tail tip. Thrice a year, they go through the molting periods to shed their outer layer. Their skin is adapted to desert environment and are also excellent swimmers and divers. The fourth species is the... Fourth species is the... Is it uh, audible? Is it uh, audible? The fourth species is the yellow monitor, also known as a golden monitor lizard, are found in Punjab, Odisha, West. Found in Punjab, Odisha, West Bengal, North and Northeast India. The snout is short and convex. The olive or yellowish brown above with irregular dark markings. Lower surface is yellowish with brown crossbars, which are the most distinct on the throat. They mostly prefer wet areas and are usually found at edges of forests. Their actual population is still unknown and requires more studies. There is another species called the clouded monitor, which was previously listed as a subspecies of the Bengal monitor found along the Indochina borders. Their color coloration comprises of yellow spots on a brown gray base, they look similar to Bengal monitors, but they have large and they have an enlarged supraocular scales located immediately above the eyes, which are absent in Bengal monitors. Sharp claws make them excellent tree climbers. Over to you, Manjari. Thank you guys. So uh, it was really a good talk. Now I call upon Mahendra Devanta and Dr. Jay Shankar. Yeah, uh, Mahindra, if you're there, I'm sharing the slide. Yes, sir. Please share my slide. Yes, sir. Please share my slide. Yes, sir. Can you see now? Is it visible? Yes, sir. Yes, yeah, visible, go sir. Ahead. Go ahead. OK. Good evening, everyone. I hereby presenting the sighting of the common uh, monitor lizard, that is the Varanus bengalensis, reported in Abu Road, Rajasthan, India. Uh, this uh, study or sighting um, with us, uh, Jay Shankar. Uh, sighting of the common monitor lizard, Varanus bengalensis, is Abu Road, Shiroi, Rajasthan. Abu Road is the part of the uh, Malaya, uh, Arauli range of the that high altitude regions. The present observation on the Varanus bengalensis were made on 2nd October 2019, that is the near to Kui Sangna Dam. Another uh, uh, Varnas is cited uh, sept 16 September 2021 near to the Markundeshwar temple that is uh, near to the Abu Road. And another one is the Nichlagad uh, that is the cited in 28th March uh, 2001 in between around 11 to uh, 17 hours at the Krishna temple pond 
in the Abu Road, Siroi district, southern, that is the uh, southern part of the Rajasthan. This actually, this is the first time uh, from these regions. If we, uh, so according to the uh, conservation status by the IUCN, then is the near threatened species, or we uh, included in cities listed appendix first, and in our uh, Wildlife Protection Act, Indian Wildlife Protection Act 1972, this is under the schedule first. Next one, sir. This is the three different uh, sites. One is the Kuyi Sangna Dam. Second one is the Markundeshwar Temples. And last one is the Krishna Temples that's uh, surrounded by the dry deciduous forest patches in the foothill, uh, foothill region of the Mount Abu Valley of the Rajasthan. Abu Road is the situated in the foothill of the Mount Abu. Uh, this is also part, this is the part of the Arauli hill range that uh, uh, spanning between the uh, Delhi, Rajasthan, Gujarat uh, highway of the northern western India. Uh, during the uh, observation, we take photograph by using uh, such Nikon camera uh, specification as mentioned here. The present observation on the awareness uh, Bengal lenses were made on 2nd October, 16 September. Uh, 2001st and 28 March uh, 2001st. Uh, I already talked about all these different uh, dates. Uh, this species actually when we saw uh, moving around solitary and moving here and there. But now we if we go through the all the Varandi species. Next one sir. Then in India there is the four Varandi species. One is the desert monitor lizard, that is the Vernus gracious. Yellow monitor lizard, large monitor, uh, large uh, Bengal monitor lizard, that is also called common monitor lizard, that is the Vernus bengalensis. This is the part of the over study area. And another one is the water monitor lizard. Uh, in If we saw uh, in the Rajasthan, then Vernus um, gracious and Vernus bengalensis uh, found in this region. And if we uh, particularly uh, go through the northwestern Rajasthan, then there is the endemic to the desert monitor lizard. Whereas Bengalensis is a carnivorous, or we say that the all variety, most of the variety uh, family belong to all the carnivorous and know the squenches carcasses. They take to food as annelids, insect amphibians, and some other uh, reptiles, birds, small mammals. The, if we previously study about in the Rajasthan of this where uh, Bengal lenses, that is the Bengal monitor lizard is reported from Jodhpur, Bikane, Nagore, Ajmer, Jaisalmer. And uh, now uh, if we saw the Rajasthan uh, in, in the map, there is the this one is species, uh, Bengal monitor lizard is throughout the Rajasthan distribution is there. You saw here the color photograph by the different species. Next one, sir. Now I thankful to Dr. J. S. Tankar. This is all about the some small study in the Abu Road. Another study we made in the Itanagar actually, when me and J.S. Ankar sir in the JSI Zoological Survey of India, that we cited Bengal monitor lizard. That is uh, the Baroness Bengal. The site is visible? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. Yes, Please sir. Visible. When we in the JSI, uh, we both uh, J.S. Ankar and me, we spotted this Bengal monitor lizard. Whereas Bengalis is citing in Itanagar in three different areas. Next one, sir. The Whereas Bengalis observation were made at three distinct sites. That is uh, in Sanki Valley, RGU, Rajiv Gandhi University, that is Doimuk area in Ganga Lake. All three different localities is under the district Papampura district that is in situated in the Arunachal Pradesh. The observation of the monitor lizard was carried out from June 2017 to September 2017. If we 
uh, talk about the conservation status according to IUCN, that is the near NT, near threatened species. This uh, in this area, uh, the all three different sites under the Itanagar Wildlife Sanctuary area. And from this region, this is the first time reported is the species. If we see it is uh, listed, this species, this is the under the appendix first. This is the all about uh, material and methods that uh, uh, we surveyed around June 2017 to September 2017. Location, Arunachal Pradesh Regional Center, APRC Center, JSI office and their residential waters that is nearby. When we uh, saw this uh, Baroness Bengalensis, they doing some activity that uh, basking on rock behind the office and found the nest hole in the bushes adjacent to entrance gate of the office. We, when we visited to RGU, Rajiv Gandhi, that is the Central University in Arunachal Pradesh, uh, Rono Hills, Doimuk, then he, there's a department of the zoology capture this uh, species and after then they release into adjoining vegetation areas. When we visit to a tourist spot in Ganga Lake, then there is uh, juvenile was spotted near to the step leading to the lake. We saw here the map of the uh, Ichanagar. Next one, sir. Arunachal Pradesh, as we know about the, that is the part of the Eastern Himalaya and uh, India, one of the world biodiversity water sport region also. The uh, district is mountain terrain. If we saw the habitat of this region, that mountain terrain with the numerous streams and rivers is there. The observation of the monitor lizard was carried out from June 2017 to September 2017 at the APRC JSI Center, Ganga Lake and RGU campus in different uh, localities. The sites of the observation are part of the adjacent to the Itanagar Wildlife Sanctuary spanning around 140 square kilometer area with highly densely uh, population inhibiting there. The studies of the behavior and time budget can be provided if we go to the future aspect, then they may be impetuous to assess the behavioral pattern of the species in the study sites with human inhibitions and if it is warrant any conservation measure should be taken in future references. The observation areas are involved with the human activities. So there may be required to concern with about the uh, human lizard conflict also is possible is there. So there is uh, some uh, agenda is there that may be conservation of this species. If we go for future research is crucial for better understanding is distribution of uh, this species, awareness Bengalensis, their population dynamics, and effect of anthropogenic resources subsidized on the behavior of monitor lizard in the field area or study area that is conducted from the Ichanagar. I mm, here thankful to Dr. M. J. Shankar. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mahindra. My presentation. Now, actually, I am suffering cold, so my okay. voice is not good. Well, Clear. Okay. The pandemic you, uh, is flushing the entire globe. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Andre and the other participants, we just wanted to share this experience of sighting. Uh, we thought this is a best forum to uh, share the experience of sighting this Varanids in Arunachal when uh, both of us were part of the Zoological <clears throat> Survey of India. Uh, I was working as scientist uh, C and also Mahindra part of the ZSI APRC there. And uh, the second sighting is from Rajasthan, where presently Mahindra is uh, stationed. Abu Road is a hill station. So we thought of sharing these experiences. Yeah, thank you, Mahindra. And uh, Ajay, over to the next speaker. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you for the insightful session, sir. And the next is Natalia who is going to speak on water monitors, human wildlife conflict in Azam. Over to you, Natalia. Okay, uh, good afternoon, everyone present here. So today my topic was on the water monitors of Assam, the human wildlife conflict in Assam. Uh, Okay, so uh, is my screen visible? 
Yes, it is. So uh, basically, Assam is the home of two species of monitor lizards. One is the water monitor, that is Varanus salvator, and the another one is the Bengal monitor, that is uh, Varanus bengalis. However, uh, uh, in my presentation, I'll be talking about the water monitors, uh, the Varanus salvators. So these are the monitors that are generally found near and around the rivers, ponds, and wetlands of Assam, uh, that is near the water sources. And due to rapid increase in human population over the last decades, their population affected by loss and fragmentation of the natural habitats, which is usually aquatic environments such as the marshlands, waste, and rivers. Uh, what, so, to list, uh, though these are not listed as the least concerned by the IUCN list, they are actually among the most heavily exploited reptiles. And so, due to uh, loss of habitat and due to their incredible adaptability, they started living among humans uh, in the semi-urban and urban areas in and around the water resources. This has led to them many times invading the fisheries and poultry farms in order to seek for an uh, easy meal, which when spotted, they are just simply being killed by the local men over there uh, as they create a really great loss for them. But at the same time, the when they're killed, they're not, uh, they're uh, served as a meal as well. Because for many people in Assam, specifically to the tribes, the meat of the monitor lizard is actually a delicacy. Its meat is also said to be uh, a good pain reliever and really good for the health. Hence, as soon as people spot one, they are just killed and served as a meal. Uh, since there are no strict rules for the protection of these lizards, uh, there have been a very few, uh, so, so they're basically uh, uh, just uh, exploited all over the state. Uh, however, there have been a very few cases recorded for people calling for forest departments for rescuing them, but most of the time this is not the case. There have been a research study about the cruelty in the Barak Valley in the South Assam, but the Barak Valley is not the only place where this takes place. In most of the upper part of the state also, you can find people just spotting a monitor lizard in and around your house and just killing it and having it as a delegacy. Though mostly the smaller ones not really killed since it's said that they won't provide a good meal. The larger ones are generally the main victim for this, and hence uh, you will not see a very big monitor lizard in the state. Rather, sometimes you will be lucky to spot a few of the smaller ones. Uh, so with that, I finish my presentation. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Natalia. And the next is Chaitanya Vora, and her topic is Threats to monitor lizards and their biology. Over to you, Chaitanya. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, sir, is the screen visible? Yes, it is. Uh, yes, okay, thank you. Sir. Uh, so I'm going to speak about the threats uh, on monitor lizard. Uh, as previously, Mama spoke so much about it, I will just uh, rush through it. Uh, monitor lizards play a vital role in the forest ecosystem as they are not just a predator, but also they play a role like the vulture in the ecosystem as a scavenger and uh, they eat the dead carcasses. Uh, that helps to protect the ecosystem uh, from various diseases. Uh, in India, it's a myth and they are seen as a potentially dangerous uh, animal and highly venomous one, uh, which is not true. Uh, many of them are venomous, but they are only slightly and they uh, wouldn't kill a person. Uh, also, Mem had talked about Arta Juris perfectly, so uh, I would skip that. Uh, also, monitor lizards are poached for their meat, which is believed to uh, 
uh, which is regarded as a delicacy and believed to be an aphrodisiac uh, in many parts of India. And it is believed that it can treat various diseases too, like asthma, or they can be applied on uh, the oil, which is uh, cotton from the monitor lizards, can be applied on snake bites and uh, ex uh, snake bites. Uh, in Assam, the Bengal monitor and common water monitors are poached for their uh, traditional uh, uh, medical, uh, are poached uh, for traditional medical practices. Uh, uh, it, and the des, uh, desert monitor population of Rajasthan uh, is also reportedly declining as they are poached for the skin. In Sundarban, the monitor lizards, uh, the monitor lizards are uh, poached for their skin. Uh, also, uh, they are exploited for their eggs and meat, which is consumed by the local community living over there. Uh, and monitor lizard uh, skin is also used for various musical instrument. Uh, one of the example is the gumat, uh, which is an South Indian musical instrument, uh, but it was banned by the state forest department after that. Also, the kanjira, which is also a musical instrument from South India, which uses the monitor lizard skin. Uh, Similar example is from New Guinea, where uh, there is also a musical instrument which uses the monitor lizard skin, which is known as the kundu. Uh, so that was the very also the habitat loss and the uh, sewage which is uh, left uh, uh, in the flood plains and all. Uh, uh, is a threat to monitor lizards. Uh, on this page, as you can see on the top left, we have uh, the water monitor lizard. Uh, uh, it is a subspecies uh, which is only found on the Andaman and Nicobar Islands. Uh, on the right, we have the Indian desert monitor. Uh, on the left, you can see the kumat, which is the musical instrument. And on the right, there is the Hatha Jodi. On the left bottom, uh, it is the golden monitor lizard. And uh, on the right bottom, we have the Bengal monitor. Uh, the status of Bengal monitor is near threatened and of the golden monitor is endangered. And the other two, uh, which are which is the moni uh, water monitor and Indian desert monitor are least concerned. Uh, talking about the biology, a uh, previous person has spoken about parthenogenesis and Sir also spoke about uh, the venom of uh, the monitor lizard. So I would skip that. Uh, coming to the point of how highly intelligent the monitor lizards are, uh, there is an example that nine monitor lizards dig into the termite mounds and there are many other species too which do that and they lay their eggs there. Uh, so termites see this hole and they work to close it and by doing so uh, they provide a secure temperature control nest for the lizard eggs. Once the eggs hatch, the young reptiles can feast on the termites before making, a, a, making their way out of the mound and it also acts as a protection uh, from predators. Uh, at the back, uh, you can see uh, the picture of a monitor lizards. Uh, monitor lizard that's a uh, emerald tree monitor lizard which is found uh, in New Guinea. Uh, on on this page, there is uh, every species from the subgenus Varanus. Uh, there is genus Varanus, and under that there is also a subgenus known as Varanus. Uh, all the species found in this subgenus are from Australia, other than the Komodo lizard. Uh, which is found on the Indonesian islands. So on the left top, you can see that's a Paranthi, which is the largest lizard found in Australia. Uh, besides that, you can see it's the lace monitor, which is also found in Australia. Uh, besides that, we have the Rosenberg's uh, monitor lizards, uh, monitor lizard, 
uh, all three of them are least concerned. Uh, as we go down on the left bottom, you can see the famous Komodo dragon, which is an endangered species. About that, we have the Spencer's monitor lizard, uh, which is also from Australia and it's least concerned. Uh, besides that, we have the Megalenia, which we talked about in the meeting, uh, which is an extinct uh, species of monitor lizard, which is estimated to be which estimated to be 3.5 to 7 meters and a, it inhabited Australia during the Palestine uh, Palestine to age. Uh, besides that, we have the Merton's monitor lizard, which is also found in Australia and the status of that is uh, it's an endangered species. Below that we have uh, the yellow spotted monitor lizard, which is also found in Australia. And besides that, we have the sand goanna, which is also from Australia. Uh, and in the background, we have the blue spotted monitor lizard, which has a very restricted uh, area distribution, and it is only found in the Bet Betanta uh, Island of Indonesia. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chaitanya. The next in line is Sparsh, representing the topic public attitude towards monitor lizards. Over to you, Sparsh. Yes, thank you. I'll just present the poster. Is it visible? Yes, it is. All right, just a second. OK. I hope I'm audible. If a species is at risk of human wildlife conflict, it is integral to understand what the people coexisting with it think about the animal. With this information, it becomes easier to draw up a conservation plan for the animal. Hello and greetings of the day to everybody. I would like to, my name is Per Sharma and I would like to talk about the a study conducted on people's perception of the water monitor lizard. This study was conducted by Mao et al. So the animal in question here is the Varanus salvator, commonly called the water monitor lizard. It faces severe risk of wildlife human, uh, human conflict in Bandar Upzila of Narayan Ganj in Bangladesh, a prehistoric location where the water monitor is coexisting with the human residents for as long as 50 years, according to the locals. For the purpose of this study, the researchers circulated a questionnaire among 60 residents living near the lizard's habitat. Let me share some statistics of their responses. More than half of the interviewed participants recognized V. salvator as a reptile, but wrongly stated it as a snake. 47% of the total participants thought the lizard was a potential threat. A large portion, that is 60%, believed it provides critical ecological services. The majority of the participants agreed that the lizard's population has declined in the past 10 years and stated habitat destruction as the primary cause for it. A significant portion of the participants agreed on urgent conservation measures for this threatened lizard, and half of them suggested relocating and initiating ex situ conservation approaches to increase their population. Around 42% also believed that targeted educational outreach events, providing foods and protecting habitat would improve their survival chance in the existing areas. Interestingly, more than half of the respondents believed 
water monitor to be harmless and a non-venomous animal, while 47% believed it to be venomous and harmful to the people. The majority of the people who believed water monitor as venomous also believed in the false myth that its tail contains venom and a single strike of it can gradually kill an animal or a person. A few believed that they have venomous teeth and that their bite can cause death. The belief in such false myths is the evidence of a lack of knowledge on the ecology of water monitor that results in a negative attitude towards them and increases the chances of potential conflicts with the local inhabitants. The water monitor is a least concerned species globally, but it is vulnerable in Bangladesh and the population trend is decreasing according to the IUCN. The respondents stated that rapid changes in the water bodies due to developmental activities and continuous pollution had changed the characteristics of these water bodies, which were once suitable for different aquatic and semi-aquatic animals to thrive on. They identified scarcity of food and intentional killing as other causes for the population decline. Effective conservation strategy and targeted education outreach events can bring positive changes in knowledge, attitude, and behavior, which will help mitigate existing anthropogenic threats to these lizards. Habitat protection and restoring the ecosystem for the remaining water monitor population in these areas should be ensured, and the probability of possible relocation should be measured by robust scientific investigation. An important suggestion that the researchers made was of empowering local people by involving them in the monitoring and conservation of the water monitor population. Communities play a vital role in biodiversity conservation. It is essential to engage them in the conservation and management of wildlife species. With these necessary steps, one can just hope that these lizards will survive to for another day and look forward to tomorrow and the future generations will also get to see this magnificent animal. Thank you for your patience, patient listening and have a great day. Thank you, Sparsh. And the next is Prayash. And the topic is uh, yes. conservation of varanids in India. Over to you, Prayash. Yes, I'll just present. Is my screen visible? Yes. Uh, yeah, OK. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Prash Portakur. Uh, now I'm here to present my uh, poster on uh, conservation of air needs in India. Well, uh, India is a home to four species of monitor lizards. Uh, we have uh, Verenas bengalensis. Uh, Bengal monitor lizards. Uh, they are quite common and have a wide range of habitat. Uh, they can found in semi-arid uh, lands to uh, wetlands. These lizards, uh, these lizards can go up to 1.7 meter of lengths. Uh, we have Verena salvator, uh, water monitor lizards. Uh, uh, they can, uh, they are uh, well, uh, uh, you know, they are the second largest. Uh, monitor lizards and uh, they can be found in uh, largely uh, semi aquatic lands and are great swimmers by the way uh, and uh, they can grow up to 1.5 meter to 3 meter of lengths uh, we have verena's flavescens uh, uh, yellow monitor lizards these are lizards uh, uh, can be seen in uh, flood plains and agricultural lands, and due to which uh, there are many uh, direct killing by the villagers too. These lizards uh, can grow up to 0.75 meters of lengths. Uh, we have Verenas gracias, desert monitor lizards. Uh, these lizards are found in highly arid, uh, uh, highly arid deserts, and uh, these lizards are grow up to one to uh, two meters of length. Uh, monitor lizards are uh, very less known to us. Uh, 
very less researches research projects are uh, dedicated to these lizards uh, well one of the most important reason for it is uh, mega mammal myopia or uh, you know uh, mega species myopia i'll just explain what mega mammal myopia is uh, according to it the only big animals or the star animal as we can say uh, who are you know uh, in verge of extinction are getting the limelight of conservation rather than the small animal uh, who are in the same condition uh, so uh, so yes uh, uh, well uh, all the four uh, lizards are listed under schedule 1 of uh, india's wildlife protection act uh, which make capturing and protecting these uh, uh, species illegal uh, but you know this also complicates the process of studying these animals uh, because of the protocols uh now I'll speak about the threats uh, threats these lizards are facing uh poaching poaching is uh, uh, you know a huge worry in uh, many countries where venenous are found uh, in india too uh, these lizards are hunted for uh, you know meats uh, uh, meat fats and skins uh, many of these uh, products are used in traditional medicines too uh the animals uh, hemipinus are also being traded uh, uh, and even in uh, online huge uh, online markets e-commerce market like flipkart ebay uh, and all uh, uh, this is because the hemipinus resembles with a uh, you know a rare central indian plant uh, martina anya or the hatta jori as in hindi uh used in tantric uh, hindu worship and believed to be uh, bring good luck apart from poaching uh, habitat loss, uh, loss is a uh, very important aspect why these uh, dragons are uh, you know uh, disappearing day by day uh well uh, long back i have also seen uh, a monitor lizards uh, in my uh, you know uh, grandparents uh, home uh and yes uh, uh, but uh, yes they are uh, not there right now and uh, and the place where they come from uh, now become concrete so it is a, a great problem these uh, dragons are facing uh, well according to uh, Gerard de Martin uh, the founder of Gary Martin projects is a well known uh, herpetologist in india said that if we can uh, you know uh, remove uh, hunting monitor lizards we can see commonly uh, you can see uh, them commonly in agricultural landscapes uh, these uh, these animals are uh, very safe to human being these are uh, safe to human being as in uh, as in uh, if they uh, you know bite or uh, as in if they uh, bite you 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 will just have uh, nausea nothing more than that and uh, well uh, they are uh, they are also a effective rodent and uh, uh, snake uh, controller population controller and yes they uh, they are an integral part of valence ecosystem thank you thank you prayash the next is basil and his topic is osteoderms in komodo dragons over to you basil uh hello good evening to everyone present here uh i'll be talking about osteoderms in komodo dragons uh can you just give me a minute to share my screen yeah yeah is my screen visible Yes, sir. You could uh, see my uh, info poster. Yes. Okay. Ah, uh, so ah, uh, talking about starting with what are Komodo dragons basically? Ah, uh, so they are basically a uh, part of the lizard family, uh, reaching up to a length of ten feet in length and uh, weighing around three hundred pounds. uh they are one of the heaviest lizard on earth and they have they are long flat headed and have rounded snouts so coming to my topic which are osteoderms so basically what are osteoderms 
they are mineral uh, mineralized structures made of calcium potassium and collagen and they are not attached to the skeleton of the komodo dragon but uh, they are a kind of a dermal armor so the mainly two uh, uses of the osteoderms can be uh, mainly for protection so basically to soften the blow from injuries and to protect vital organs <coughs> and uh, so they are basically plates which uh, are mostly present near the neck trunk and tail and over time they are they developed in the they develop as horizontal rows under the body which uh, then connect into the dorsal and the ventral osteoderms uh, the other function of the osteoderms could uh, mainly be uh, uh, during basking as they are cold blooded and they they live in an island habitat mainly uh, in the islands of indonesia like the sunda islands so uh, during basking the uh, they trap more heat so uh, so basically to raise their body temperatures yeah thank you thank you basil uh, now i call upon the last presenter of the day hina khan who is going to speak on komodo dragons i believe uh, hina is facing some technical issue that's the communication so we have been through the student presentation most of it being review work uh, that they had presented we have had an enlightening session on um, the varanids by the experts dr andre and shreya giving us the global perspective and the indian perspective respectively i thank them for their time and also sharing information with the students igniting their thoughts and minds to get involved in herpetology especially with the varanids so with that uh, i hand it over to abhishek and ajay for the vote of uh, thanks and uh, please do share the feedback form on the chat box yes over to you both I deem it to be a great honor to propose the word of thanks to all who have helped us in making this webinar such a resounding success. First of all, I would like to propose the heartly thanks to our guest speaker, Dr. Andre, for gracing today's webinar. Thank you, sir, for your very very interesting and wonderful address. I would like to thank Shreya, ma'am, for making excellent presentations and making this webinar interesting and meaningful. I would like to express our profound gratitude to our research director rev dr zavier for his presence in this webinar i would like to thank our beloved hod and natural science association coordinator dr jay sangar sir for his moral support and guidance i would like to thank all the people who have participated and made this event success now i am happy to express word of thanks to the student coordinator with me ajay for making this webinar a great success finally wonderful students who have turned up in such a great number thank you so much for your cooperation once again thank you so much everyone for your cooperation thank you yeah uh, i so take this opportunity to thank this is a tradition in natural science association allowing students to take the lead for every event for this webinar which is an international one involving dr andre uh, this Uh, the coordinators were uh, ajay and abhishek thank you both of you i am also uh, grateful to the natural science association volunteers and office bearers the presidents uh, rebecca and ashwant for toiling day and night in uh, bringing this webinar into reality and now to a successful conclusion thank you all the part participants presented their uh, view regarding varanids and the faculty and students from different parts of the country who took part in this international webinar on varanids i must place on record the support rendered by the management reverend father principal uh, dr victor lobo our registrar dr melvin colasso our dean dr beatrice quera and uh, also all my colleagues in the department of zoology who are the background players supporting us 
and motivating in whatever initiatives the Natural Science Association is involved in. So thank you all. Uh, you could see the feedback form posted in the chat box. I request all of you to fill in so that the certificates reach you for the attendee or for the presenter. Dr. Andre is still here. Thank you very much, sir, for your time. And uh, we will be uh, getting back to you, seeking your expertise in future as well. Thank you all with that. Uh, goodbye. Good evening. If the coordinators have anything, you can share. If not, we wind up the session. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir, for this wonderful opportunity. And I thank all the participants, the presenters, the speakers for the day. Thank you for making this day a wonderful again. Thank you all. Thank you once again and goodbye. Thank you, Dr. Andre. Goodbye. Take care. Bye, -bye. Goodbye, sir. Thank we you, will sir. get back to you. Thank Seek you, your sir. expertise. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, students, you can also thank Dr. Andre for his wonderful insights. Yeah. Thank you all. Bye. Bye. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you, thank you very what much, Dr. Andre, for answering all our doubts and questions.